to another episode of the Ten Horse Money Fishing YouTube channel, Tuesday Night Live. Sorry I missed last week. I've been battling COVID. I'm still a little bit under the weather. I got this freaking head cold. It's like typically when I get a cold, which hasn't happened in a long time, but it's like a three or four day deal. And then I just wake up one morning. I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. But this thing's just lingering, lingering, lingering on. So apologize for not not showing up last week, but we got a good show in store for you tonight. Uh, we got Big Al on the other end, and the reason Big Al is on the other end is because we got a kind of a pretty big tournament coming up this weekend, the Big Bass Bash. So we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna break that down all night long. Um, man, first time I fished a bass, probably like five or six years ago. Okay, and I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Sure holy cow it's like it's like opening it's like opening morning at montauk oh know? yeah just unbelievable the amount of people that it draws and it's gotten bigger and bigger and it just seems like it just keeps growing um is that is that the the uh synopsis for this year too is it growing just like like you thought it would yeah um look this is um this is going on uh, 17 years uh that the tarot family's been putting this event on uh 17 years they've been doing the fall event uh 12 years doing the spring event plus they got the one at grand but yeah the growth over the years you know when we started it was 400 boats or i should say 400 anglers 400 anglers yeah over 200 boats and you know we're probably predictions will be similar to last year's spring and fall 3,500 to 4,000 anglers um from across the country you know kids division uh, ladies division um so it's uh it's a huge event for anybody that wants to come down here. And even if you don't fish, there's so many things to do down here at Lake of the Ozarks. I mean, you know it well where people go out there shopping and then go, you know, play miniature golf, go-kart and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of good restaurants and all that kind of stuff down here. So plenty to do for the family. Yeah, that's that's the cool thing. It's like I've had a couple of people reach out to me over the last week or so, and they're like, are you fishing the bash? And, you know, I, I can't right now because I have to work. But yeah. several people said it's an annual event for them. They right. – you know, so there's a couple of different mindsets on it. You know, there's some people that go down there, they're looking for one fish. They're throwing yeah. whatever to catch one fish. And then I, I would say just as many people, if not more, are going down there as an annual event. They get together with their buddies. They rent a house. They they eat. They drink. Um, they be merry all weekend. And, and they go back to reality on, on Monday. And that's the cool thing about this. It's 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 gotten so big and it's been going on for so long that it's an annual event for a lot of people and everybody looks forward to it, you know, multiple, twice a year, spring and fall. You know what, what kind of just popped in my head when you were talking about that, that is an interesting point there. And a lot of people I talk to say that, but it's almost like for the somewhat avid angler and the weekend angler, it's almost like two more holidays. You know, it's like you got yeah. Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, two big bass bashes, you know, 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day. So you're exactly right. People kind of build their camera or their calendar, you know, of course, around the family stuff when it comes to graduation and all that stuff. But the Big Bass Bash is one of those things. It's like I said, for the 17 years it's been around, the, the growth and participation and the people that actually come back to the area um, during the summer and, and they're not bass fishing. And they only came here because of the Big Bass Bash to see what a gem this uh, whole community is. Yeah, Jake says uh, me and the boys treat it like a deer camp, and I think that's what it's become. It's like absolutely a op open a day at Montauk. It's deer yep. camp. It's a little bit of everything. Um, Spend to time with the boys and the, and the daughters and the grandparents and the parents, and you know, it's just you know, even if you don't go out there and catch a fish, like I said, it's almost kind of a, a lottery fish tournament, right place, right time, all that kind of stuff. But just to have those memories, you know, I just lost my dad a couple months ago. And those are the memories that I remember going down to Table Rock and Lake of the Ozarks and Bennett Springs and Montauk and Truman and all that kind of stuff, just camping in the Starcraft. You know, we'd catch some bluegills. Sometimes we wouldn't catch fish. But, you know, as you get older, you appreciate all those times when you went out with your, you know, folks and, and did stuff like that. Yeah. And the thing about the thing that's cool about this tournament, it's it's so much different than your regular weekend tournament where you're fishing against um you know, the best of the best, the local hammers. This is something that literally anybody can win. I mean, there's, there's skill involved for sure, but right. there's, you're fishing for one fish and that's the, that's the win the tournament. The good thing is, is you have a deep payout. Um, you've got, you know, every, you got four, pay, I think it's four payouts throughout the day, each day. And then you've got however many places. So it's not just catching 
the biggest fish, you've got a lot of opportunities along the way to, to make your money back and not, not to mention the amount of fun. Talk about the the entry fee, the the days, and then how the payouts work and stuff. Okay, so let's just talk about uh, entries. You can still go online at BigBassBash.com. That's the easiest way to pay with a credit card. But then on Friday, the 19th at PB2 in Osage Beach, we'll have registration there from noon to 7. We've got a registration line. We've got T-shirts for sale. We've got apparel for sale. We'll have about 20 vendors there, a food truck, a smoothie truck. So it's a big festival from 12 to 7 o'clock on Friday. Um, the entry into it's $200, go out there to fish for two days, or you can fish for one day. Um, don't quote me on this and it's all online. Like I said, I think it's 135. Um, but anyway, um, a minimal investment for an opportunity to cash a six figure check. And then talking about the payoff spots, we, we go down to the top four. So 20, 10 and 5,000 for those second, third and fourth places. But then the two hourly windows, um, on Saturday and Sunday, we've got four of those slots, uh, they mirror each other on Saturday and Sunday. So 6.30 to 9, 9 to 11, 11 to 1, and 1 to 3, you've got 45 opportunities to win money. And then if you buy a bonus T-shirt, you got a, a 46 spot. You increase your odds by eight payout spots over the two days. Um, and then we've got, of course, the exact 3.00 and 4.00. Those are worth 500 bucks, and those are unlimited. And then there's a couple of other promotions we're doing out there with uh, John 316 with Justin Swast. And then Mary Terrell's birthday will be on Saturday. And Charlie's uh, coming up with a special weight for his daughter's birthday for whatever it might be. Um, uh, as far as that weight goes, uh, 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. He'll uh, let everybody know on the broadcast. So the one of the interesting things is that that 3-0 and then the 4-0. Yeah. If you... You know, typically it takes about a four pound fish to get to get a check. But if you've got a fish that you think weighs three pounds right on the money, what's what's that pay? Five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Yeah. So and those are unlimited. I mean, if they got to pay out 50 on Saturday and 50 on Sunday, they will. Um, here, here, here's the, the 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 great marketing behind that right there. I mean, look, you, you fished down here before. You know, you can go out there and catch a, a whole bunch of fish and they're just not of any size. but you can get a three pounder to where you, you increase the opportunity for all the anglers to catch a three pounder uh, still, you know, fairly hard, but not too difficult compared to catching a seven or an eight pounder to win the thing. Sure. Sure. But to have the opportunity to get to the scale three zero zero or four zero zero on the money and get $500 uh, that's a higher payout than I think like maybe um, 30th spot or 25th spot on the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what about the, the women's division? You said there's a women's division. There's, is there a kid's division too? Yeah. So there's a ladies division. Uh, they have a separate uh, champion pot, but they also are fishing in the uh, grand prize for a hundred thousand dollars. So um, uh, you've got that opportunity there. And then we've got our kids division uh, 12 and under uh, you can fish from the boat, the beach, the dock or the shore. And you're fishing for four species, uh, bass, crappie, bluegill, and catfish. And those top three uh, of each of those species on Saturday and Sunday uh, will get a trophy and cash prize at the award ceremony starting on Sunday, the 21st, at 4.30. Okay. Yeah. And Stephanie wants to know, is there a limit to the number of boats? Uh, no, there's not a limit to the number of boats. It's just to break down. So... Last year or last spring, uh, we had about, I think, 3,980 anglers. And roughly the way that we break that down, because like I said, the uh, occupancy for a boat is based on the manufacturer. So a bass boat, you're allowed to have three on there max. And then there's a lot of people out there fishing with deck boats and pontoon boats and all that kind of stuff, which you can have seven or eight. So boat numbers that go out there, typically what you'll see out there just involved in the tournament. If we had, you know, almost 4,000 anglers, you're talking about 1,800 to 1,900 boats. But like I stated, um, look, this, this place is 105 miles long, more shoreline than state of California. There's pretty, plenty of room. Plus, we spread out uh, the different weigh-in stations. We start at the dam at Point Randall, move our way up to Alhana, then to PB2, which is ground zero for the event, then Red Oak Resort. And then up the river to Ivy Bend. So if you break that down uh, on our website with our uh, latitude and longitude on Google Maps, 
it's about 20 to 25 miles in between each weigh-in station. So what that does is spreads the anglers, people that like to fish near the river or up there, people by the dam, and then people by the main channel. Okay. So the best way to enter is you can do it online. Yep. Uh, but if you're already, if you're down in the area and you decide you want to jump in, you can come to PB2. Is that right? You guys are going to be set up there? Yeah. PB2 on April 19th, which is this Friday from 12 to seven o'clock, we will take registration or you can go to all three Fitz fishing locations and uh, you can get registered there and buy your t-shirt. Okay. So the morning of the tournament, you can get out to your spot whenever. I mean, if you want to go out there at four in the morning and, and sit on your cool. hole, you can. You just can't cast until what, 6.30? 6.30 on both Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And then it's all about finding one of those weighing stations. You catch a bass that you think weighs three or four or, or yeah. something that's going to be, you know, check worthy. You run it to the different locations. And um, is there going to be any kind of communication as far as uh, uh, are you running anything on a radio or? Yeah, so, uh, so 92.7, the mix, will broadcast uh, live uh, on-site at PB2 uh, on Saturday and Sunday. But if you're looking to find out what's going on as far as weights go for that particular hourly session, you go to bigbassbash.com on your smartphone or iPhone. Uh, you go to the three bars up in the top right corner. Hit on that. It brings down live leaderboard. You hit that, and it'll update the top 45. Uh, fish for that particular po um, uh, hourly uh, uh, payout period, that two-hour window. And that's usually updated about every two minutes. So it's pretty accurate as far as what's going on throughout the day, minute by minute. Yeah. Can there, there and there can be some strategy too, because if you're sitting oh, yeah. on a, if you're sitting on a four, two, four, and you're watching that and somebody yeah. comes in with one that's that last spot's a little bit above, you might as well sit on that fish and wait till the yeah. next pay period. You know, you made a good point earlier. Um, just kind of some early data out there and you can go to fishing intel they've got all the data as far as every event that's taken place here what the bottom fish was what the top fish where it was caught at etc etc but particularly that 45th position um four on saturday and four on sunday you're gonna need a four two five a four three a four four don't get me wrong. We've got the live leaderboard up there. I've seen some three eights, three nines, and four ones cash a check in that 45th or 46th position. But if you got anything over five pounds, get that fish into a weigh-in station. You're going to hit some type of a check uh, in that particular weigh-in period. And the other thing that I want to uh, let the anglers know out there is remember, two fish per angler in the live well at one time. So if you got one person on the boat, two fish in the live well. Two people, four, three people, six. So just keep that in mind. That's part of the rules uh, for the event. Okay. That's a, that's a new one. I did not know that. That's Yeah. So idea. that's been in place for, it used to be one fish, but about eight to 10 years ago, we changed it to two fish. That way you can strategize and work your way and not have to bring in a fish and waste time that keeps you out there fishing more. That's, that's what we want for the anglers. We want them to fish about 95% of the time and just weigh in 5% of the time. Okay, cool. Before we let you go, what do you think the winning weight is going to be? And what do you think it's going to be caught on? Ah, oh, man, the, the, the million dollar question. Hey, listen, man, I'm, I'm kind of fired up, dude. I think we get an eight pounder. I eight think we pounder. Get first, I think we get our first eight pounder. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, I've had a couple of AIA events here that I've seen these bags come in with these anglers. One this past Sunday. I've seen what Just Fish is doing, Angler's Choice, OMTT. A lot of big and healthy fish have come in. And this is kind of, look, we saw them on beds last weekend. It was warm. It was about 80, 83 degrees air temperature outside. However, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week, we get down to 40 with a high of 61. It could push those fish back off those beds. And they could be in that quasi pre-spawn period. But maybe they're already committed and they're going to see more and more on beds here. So that being said, look, I think we get our first eight pounder. They look really healthy and there's some out there that we haven't seen, but there's some big ones on beds. And then if I had to say, you know, if you're, if you're talking about a bed fish, you know, you can't go wrong with one of them little white flukes and just kind of messing around there. But everybody this past weekend, all the big boys, Burhorse and Fitzpatrick, uh, Jordan, uh, 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 McFarlane, 
everything that they caught there was basically on a jig with a creature bait and fish and docks, which we all know LOZs like that. So it's always repetitive, Gabe. It's the green pumpkin, the PB and J, and the black and blue, dude. Just beat those docks with that. Yeah. You know. So, so you you going with white fluke or you going with the jig? Well, I, if I see it on the if I was if I was fishing on a bed, I'd throw that white fluke out there. If I'm going to the docks and I'm pitching and skipping, go with that jig uh, and that creature bait on there. I mean, they love them. Here's something that I learned from the classic that was really cool that I never knew about fishing. And folks, I do not fish a lot, so I am a non-expert as they get. Here's the deal. Hank Cherry, when he went out and practiced um, uh, for the classic, he went and hit some waypoints where he saw those dock floats were in the sun early and which ones were in the sun late afternoon. And in the morning, he would go and hit those, and those fish would belly up to those warmer black dock floats. So maybe in the morning time, like I said, when you get out there, it's going to be in the high 30s, first cast probably in the low 40s. You know, if the sun pops up and we've got some blue skies, you know, you look for that, how long the sun's been up, and maybe around 7.30, 8 o'clock, a big one kind of bellies up there to warm up if they're not bedding, and, you know, you throw that jig in there just hold on and be careful of the cables is all I got to say. That's a pro tip, Al, for someone who doesn't fish. That's <laughs> hey, a pro for tip, nobody that's not a, hey, sometimes I pick up a little bit of juju from these guys and I pay attention. <laughs> that's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Hey, how, about Cole, how about Cole McFarland, man? He, he wins the Toyota Series on Grand and comes and wins the Anglers in Action on Lake of the Ozarks. Let me tell you something. Ryan Jordan and Cole McFarland are hot. They just popped $28,000 team tournament trail with the midway usa anglers and action guys they got 10,000 aia 10,000 anglers port and 8,000 or yeah 8,000 for uh first flight money and then another thousand dollars from bait cave customs Twenty nine thousand dollars, the biggest purse in anglers in action history that's big big money. Oh. i don't care what tournament you know that's, oh, that's a 100%. great payback dude i tell you what i was sitting there weighing and fish we had about nine teams left going these guys would come up here and I'd pick up this bag and kind of look at them, man. They were getting all nervous and then I'd put it on the scale and kind of put my hand on it and go up to like 38 pounds and then down to 24. And then I'm like, oh, they survived another one, man. But they were looking at me. By the end of it, Ryan was like, listen here, man, if you don't get through this way in quick, I'm going to come yeah. over and bust you. So yeah. I got through it and they end up winning. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right, man. We're going to let you roll. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, Good luck this weekend, and uh, anybody that's on here and you're interested in checking that out, do yourself a favor, go down there and jump in the tournament. It's a lot of fun. Hey, real quick, I heard there's somebody really, really special in that green room by the name of Dion Hemet. Am I correct? Yes, you are. All right, let's go to Dion. We're going to bring him in. Good night, all. See ya. Later, buddy. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey. Been you've been back there in time out. We're gonna bring you in and let you talk right. for a while. I'm ready to go. Heck yeah. Yeah, that's a I mean that's a fun thing. I, I wish uh it's it's hard to fish everything, you know. You got at work, I only have so much vacation time, and I got some BFLs and you got uh just fit, you know, just bull shows trips, just fun trips and stuff. And yeah. um we've got the Warrior William coming up in October, and it's like uh when I retire, I'm gonna fish all those things, I'm gonna be everywhere all at once. I'll be broke, but I'll be happy, you know. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. So how, how have you been? I've been all right. I've been doing good. Been doing fine. Good. I'm, uh, I'm getting back to fishing a little bit and and uh, doing good. Healing so up. I heard your, heard your golf game's been It's not bad. Strong. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. We uh, we played nine holes last night, and, and we ended up shooting one under. So – Really? Yeah, Peyton's Impressive. pretty damn good. He's pretty okay. good. He's been practicing. That was a full size golf cor course, not yeah. not just miniature golf. No, not miniature golf. No windmills. No nothing <laughs> like that. No, it's a real deal. <laughs> well, wow, that's it's awesome. It's kind of hard for me and Peyton to play together because you know he's a big manly dude, and and uh, like I say, I I twisted my knee when I tried to really uncork one and. And, you know, he, it's hard for him to explain, you know, when he hits, it sounds like a ball goes into about four pieces. And, uh, and then, you know, I stand up there and I get ready to hit and I try to do the same thing. And yeah, I almost fell down and killed myself. So, but, but anyways, we're doing good. Every, everybody's doing good. Everybody's fishing a lot. You know, everything's going good. 
Yeah, excellent. So, man, Al, Al kind of had a big prediction there. He said a pounder. Oh, I think this is the year. Yeah, I really do. We, um, you know, the the high school kids caught a giant. Um, you know, when they had their tournament, you know, like an eight ninety something, you know, something crazy like that. Um, Lawson had a day about two weeks ago that he caught two over eight in the same day. Um, so they're they're biting, they're out there, you know. It, it's happening this year for some reason. You know, I watched the BFL. You know, I bet you there was twenty over six caught in it. Uh, anglers in action, like say Sunday. You know, Lawson had nineteen pounds and finished eleventh. You know, so yeah, the big ones are biting. It's happening right now. Yeah, that's amazing. The amount the bags that Lake of the Ozarks has been kicking out. I've been paying attention yeah. to it as well. It's just yeah, it's. It's, amazing. it's doing good right now. I mean, there are lots of fish being caught. Uh, you know, I think good combo of some good dirty water, too, is happening. You know, so this year is going to be a little bit different in that respect. We've got a lot of stained water around the lake, uh, but we still got a lot of clear water, too. So it's going to allow everybody to really loosen up and fish whatever they want to fish, you know, fish their strengths. And, and so I think they're going to bust them. Yeah. Are you getting any weather right now down there? Oh, it's been raining a little bit. We had a little rainstorm this morning blow through, and and we're supposed to get some weather this evening. Uh, there's actually tornado warnings just north of us. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we got another storm rolling through, but I don't expect a great lot of rain out of any of it. Uh, but it's supposed to be some lightning and stuff like that. So, but And, and Big Al's right. They, did, they caught some off the bed last weekend. Um, you know, and, but my theory is always going to stay the same, you know, with that, um, you know, yeah, there can be a few go up to spawn, but really if all the fish in Lake of the Ozarks went to the bank and spawn at the same year, at the same week of the year, they'd be killing them with the trolling motors because there's so many fish in Lake of the Ozarks. They don't all spawn at the same time. And, uh, you know, no matter what the water temperature does, no matter what the weather temperature does, there's just the full moon in May is still probably the best spawn. Uh, so, you know, everybody gets all excited when they see one standing on the bank. Oh, my gosh, looky there, they're spawning. No, no, there's just a few up there thinking about it. And normally they're those little young dumb ones, you know, that's not really even ones that you want to, be chasing too much. Uh, there is a few fish, a few good ones every now and then too, but but really the bulk of the population, I don't think are doing it yet. Um, and you throw 3,800 boats out, 3,800 people out there chasing them, that really hurts the spawn also. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it just, it just drives them off the bank and, and, uh, and those really big ones, you know, will still be caught probably just out there in four or five feet of water. Yeah. And then and then they don't spawn. I was out on the water um, Saturday and Sunday. I got to go for a few hours. I'm, I was just like sitting in the house with this COVID crap, and it, it it was all I could do to get out of the house, but I couldn't stand it anymore. I, I made myself get out and hook my boat up and go to the lake. And I'd heard that there were some spawning fish on the lake. And I looked in a couple different areas, nothing couldn't see you know the, the lake amazon's got grass so you can typically see a tan colored spot that they wall yeah. out in that grass so it's it they're pretty the beds are pretty easy to see water visibility is oh anywhere from foot and a half but five feet a lot of them a lot of the lakes four to five feet so you got pretty good visibility but i had to go in a couple different coves and look and finally i pulled back out more main lake and i found I found a good section where I started seeing some beds and started catching some fish. And then I'm like, okay, I know what I'm, I know what, I know what I'm looking for. So I tried to duplicate that pattern in a different area of the lake and it just wasn't going on. I mean, I ran, I ran to a different section of the lake and these are areas where, you know, the backs of coves where a Creek comes in like typical spawning type of places. They weren't there. I mean, I covered, mm -hmm. I covered a thousand yards of bank and I might see one bed maybe. And then I, then I go back into a, a different Creek and they're back there. They're doing it right there. So, you know, what, 
what I've learned over the years is we, we like you just said, you think they all kind of start spawning at once. And that's not the way it, it happens. They, they there's certain sections of the lake where they spawn at different times. And I mean, the reason they do that is that just um, that entails that they're going to their survival. You know, if, if they all went up at one time and something crazy happened and all the beds went high and dry, then you'd lose a whole year class of, of fish. So they kind of spread it out. Mother, mother nature takes care of it. I mean, simple as that. Uh, and I'll tell you where I, where I base it as much as anything. And that's the crappie spawn also. Uh, you know, the crappie spawn always happens, you know, three weeks, two to three weeks, most of the time ahead of the bass. And uh, me and Peyton have been out crappie fishing quite a bit. Uh, you know, I, I got sick back this winter and uh, spent some time in the hospital and I'm still recouping from that. And uh, so I, I really can't go 10, 10, 12 hours a day, you know, so, so Peyton's been taking it easy on me and we've been crappie fishing some and I've been bass fishing also, but, uh, but I've been doing a lot of crappie fishing and, uh, and the crappie are not on the bank spawning great yet. They are in places. Uh, and when I say that it's spotty, there's some here, there's some there, you know, I've been clean up by Warsaw and I've been all the way to the dam on, on Lake of the Ozarks and, uh, and they are trying to spawn in a few areas, uh, but they're not doing it completely. The bulk of the crappie are still out. And, um, and so that's probably coming up this next full moon, you know, is when they're going to spawn. And like I say, the bass are always after that, you know, uh, or the big, the big majority of them. And, uh, and like I say, it's always been, you know, the full moon in May is the best here. And, uh, and my dad, you know, my dad said it, you know, forever. He said, yeah, there might be some go up and do it in April. And he said the water temperature might be, you know, 65 degrees and perfect, you know, but still it's the length of the day. They know exactly what time of the year is best for them to go to the bank and spawn. And, uh, and like I say, it, it's still going to be the same moon. You know, I don't care if the water temperature is 80 degrees, uh, and, and the crazy thing about Lake of the Ozarks and where I have been fishing from one end of it to the other, there's almost a 10 degree water temperature difference from dam to dam. That's, that's a lot of wow. different in water temperature, you know, and, and you go up in the Nianguas and, you know, it gets warmer. Uh, you go up in the major creeks on the upper end, it's warmer. Uh, then you get back down by the dam and some of that water, like I say, is almost 10 degrees cooler. Uh, you know, so... You know, it, it these 80 degree days are dang sure pushing them to the bank. Um, do I think they're going to be close to the bank? Absolutely. You know, they're they're pretty much connected to the bank right now, and I don't care what the weather does. That's not going to change. Uh, you know, this tournament should be one shallow. You know, and the bulk of what gets caught should be in six, seven foot or less. You know, uh, in the real, real clear water, they can spawn out that deep. Um, I don't think they will this time, you know, because the water temperature is still cooler. You know, the water temperature that you take is surface temperature, you know, that all of our bass boats is connected to your dang trolling motor or to the back of your boat. And, uh, you know, so go down four feet. What's the water temperature, you know, and, and, and so in that cleaner, clearer water, sometimes they spawn a little bit later, you know, just because the water temperature is a little bit cooler down there where they're going to do it. And, uh, you know, so, so do I think it's totally going to be a spawn tournament? No, I don't, you know, uh, I, I suspect that the biggest bass that'll get caught in this tournament will still be not looked at. You know, I don't, I don't think it'll be visually looked at and caught. Um, and that comes from a guy who loves to do it. You know, I love to look for him. You know, it's, it's like a hunt to me, you know, I, I go hunt down the right ones and, and catch them. Can you win a tournament doing that right now? Absolutely. You catch some four pounders, but to say you're going to catch a seven or an eight, uh, you know, I don't think that group's ready to go up there yet. You know, I think that group is still out there, you know, hanging just off the banks, standing under a boat dock for the most part, probably. Um, they might be past like secondary points, but they're still not all the way up on the bank. They're, they're still hanging out there around 
one of the gazillion boat docks on Lake of the Ozarks waiting to, you know, for everything to get right, the time of the year to get right. And, and uh, you know, so, so I think it's going to be one of those deals where, you know, if you're up there looking for them solely on the bank, you're going to be fishing right past where the big ones actually are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think a bunch of them big ones. And, and like I said, also, you throw that many guys out there running around in and out of those docks, they spook a lot of those big ones. And those big ones won't take that, you know, because they're not actually ready to spawn yet. So anything you do to mess that way of thinking up for that bass, she's just going back out there and suspend and hang out, you know. Uh, and like I say, when that happens, she's not an easy fish to catch because everything that you fish with either goes deeper than what she's standing or you're not fishing above her. And when you're catching suspended bass, you almost got to fish above them, you know. And when she suspends in six foot of water, that's kind of a tricky little water column right there, you know, because most everything you want to fish with, you're going to fish under a lot of times. And, uh, and like I say, a shallow suspended bass is kind of tricky to catch unless she's aggressive enough to come on up and eat some off the top, you know, and some of them can be, um, you know, I fished with, I fished with a 12 year old in that, in that high school tournament, uh, not la last weekend, but weekend before last. And, uh, you know, he threw a spook a lot when we was out there because he had been catching them at his home around his docks and stuff, you know, right on the bank on a spook. And, uh, and I finally had to ask him the first day when we were fishing, I said, dude, how many big ones did you catch doing it? Oh, I haven't caught a big one. I said, that's because they're not up there yet. I said, you know, you're, you're pushing, you, you want to catch them on top water as we all do. You know, we all want to catch them on top water and stuff like that, but you just kind of pushing the fact, you know, um, and I have a hard time trying to make something like that happen really when there's that many boats out there. You know, I might pick up a regular old Zara Spook or a, or a buzz bait or something like that for the first hour. But after the first hour, let's be realistic. You're fishing behind somebody from that moment on, probably. Yep. You know, you might get one or two spots in the morning where it's just you going down the bank. But shortly thereafter you're following somebody down the bank and you better figure out how to outfish the fish and the guy that just went down the bank in front of you. Uh, you know, and, and I look, I look for stuff. I look for stuff, you know, every day on Lake of the Ozarks. It's not obvious, you know, really, really obscure piece of cover, you know, something like that. You know, one of, one of the best things that can happen to you is when you're cruising along in and out of them boat docks and your big motor hits something guess what? You were, if you would have been two inches to the left or two inches to the right, you wouldn't have known that was even there. But once I hit it, I know exactly where it's at. And I will mark that in my mind. I will mark it, look at that dock or look at the bank where I just did that. And what that is, is that's a good piece of cover that not everybody's going to fish the same way. You know, even with forward facing sonar and stuff like that, you still, you're going to miss some. And, uh, you know, so any little, like I say, any little piece of brush or something hard or something like that that you bump with your big motor or you go to spin your boat around and or cross across a cove and you bump something, you know, that's that's a potential for where a big one's going to end up suspending in that shallow water. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different variables in the spawns, like, um, you know, the, the length of the day. The, the the moon phase the water temp um you could almost say the big bass bash now they're going to hold off till after that um what do you think about like do, water, do, I, think water? The bash, do I think the bash affects the spawn absolutely yeah 100 what about, what about the water level too i mean oh, water are, level can it's down right. now you know it's overall the whole lake is a little bit lower than normal uh you know and i don't foresee it coming up a whole lot so yeah it's it exposes a lot of that brush. Another thing, these 80 degree days, there's a ton of crappie anglers out there now. They're out there fishing and they're throwing at all the obvious stuff that normally a bass would stand on. And, you know, the thing of it is, you know, that bass is not going to take but so much, you know, and, and she's going to just move away from that stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So, 
am I saying don't throw it at a, at a log? No, you got to throw it everything like that. But just keep in mind, you're probably not the first one there, you know, and, and if you were hiding from fishermen, where would you hide, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I treat it as a deer hunt, you know, where would a big one live? You know, where would, where would a big one hide if too many people got around it, you know, and, and, uh, and my dad was excellent at that. My dad was an outdoorsman. And so that was as big a part as if the shad were there or the, the crawfish were there, you know, was, okay, if I was hanging out, where would I be, you know, where I didn't get jacked with by, I mean, I don't know how many boats was on the lake last weekend, but it was a lot, a lot of fishermen out there last weekend. The weekend before was the BFL. Uh, during the BFL, there was a big tournament out of the Kaufman ramp. Uh, and out of Warsaw, there was a big one, you know, that they said had 80 or 90 boats. Uh, you know, that's the thing, you know, they, they, they've been hammered, you know, already. And then you throw 3,800 people out there after them again, it's going to make them a little spooky, a little skittish, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I want to bring up, I want to bring that up too, while we're talking about that. I, I remember last time I fished the bash. Like you said, you you might get your first little stretch by yourself in the morning, but after that, you're fishing behind somebody, and it and it can get frustrating. It's like you you're like, okay, let's leave. We're gonna go up uh, and fish, you know, twenty six mile marker, and you and you got your favorite cove, and you slow down and you look, and there's five other boats. There's three on this side, and there's three on that side. So then you pull out and you go to the next one, and there's two on the main lake points, and there's three and three, and every cove has got somebody, and and then and then there's a lot of people that they don't fish a whole lot, you know? Um, so you're going to run into some scenarios where you might be, have a tendency to butt heads with people, but just remember, man, it's, uh, you know, it, it's about having fun. Yeah. You're fishing yeah. for money. Of course it's a tournament, but also keep your cool, man. Don't get, don't no. get in a fight with somebody because it can there's be tempting, no, you know, there's, there's no need because there's too many people out there. Just go fishing, you know, have a good time. Uh, you're fishing for one bass. Too. You know, it, it's not like you're fishing for 20 or 30 or, or, you know, 19, 20 pounds, stuff like that. You're fishing for one, you know, and uh, put a little thought into it. You know, don't just go out there and, you know, chase them, you know, like you would every weekend. You know, you got to put some thought into it. where would a seven pounder come from, you know. Uh, and, and like I say, it, it's always with me. You know, it's a it's a suspended deal during this bash. Uh, you know, 99% of them big fish that get weighed in are suspended somehow. And uh, and that's nothing more than your hour window in the morning of that fish not knowing there's many fishermen out there. They don't take long. You know, don't take long, and they're all aware. And, uh, you know, like I say, I relate a lot of it to, to deer hunting and stuff like that, and, you know, how long does it take a giant buck to go nocturnal? One time, <laughs> you know, one time of seeing an orange or getting shot at or something like that. And you'll never see that deer again during the day. Yes, bass have a brain the size of a pea, or that's what they say anyways. By golly, they use it pretty efficiently on every given day, you know. Uh, if not, everybody would catch seven pounders because this lake is full of them. And, and, and when I say that, literally, Lake of the Ozarks would rank in the top two or three within a 500-mile a circle right here of the best lakes in the country, hands down, four six-pounders. You know, that BFL, like I said, I bet you there was 36 pounders weighed in. Uh, and this weekend, same deal. Seemed like everybody had a six-pounder. And, uh, and it was... You know, that's just the way it is. They live there. And when they're biting, they're going to catch them. You know, everybody's going to catch them. Uh, they will catch them this weekend, too. You know, uh, they always do. Um, I just think there's a few big ones that are out there happening right now. So I really, I, I'm with Big Al. I think this will be the biggest year they've ever had as far as a big one. I think somebody will catch an eight this year. Uh, you know, and... and because the fish are in perfect health too they're fat they're healthy they're full of shad 
Uh, a lot of them are full of crawdads, you know. Uh, Lawson's live well was clear full of crawfish, you know, after he got done weighing in 19 pounds this weekend, you know, and he finished 11th, by the way, 19 pounds and finished 11th. It's amazing. You know, now it only took 22 to win, but still lots and lots of big bass, you know, really nice fish, you know. Um, you know, so you just got to, you just got to tell yourself, you know, what, what am I going to do a slightly different than everybody else? Um, you know, I'm still going to pitch a jig around a ton uh, because I feel like a crawfish to a bass is his favorite meal. Uh, you know, and it doesn't matter if he's a pound and a half Kentucky or it don't matter if he's a 10 and a half pound, you know, northern strain largemouth. His favorite meal is still a jig of some sort, a crawfish imitation. Uh, and, I, and I feel like when you throw all that pressure out there, you know, everybody throws a spinner bait. Lots of people throw swim baits now. Everybody thinks the swim bait's the great salvation of everything. You know, I, I would probably, you know, to hear Big Al, what he, what he said, that stuff really, that, that's really, really a good, you know, I know he's, he, he does fish some, and if nothing else, he gets to hear about it a lot. Maybe a big creature bait, you know, because big creature baits imitating the bluegill, you know, and a bluegill to a bass, that's something he sees all the time. You know, there's all the time, he's all the time standing in the same pile of brush with 20 of the bluegill, you know, and you pitch an imitation in there that looks like bluegill that maybe does something a little bit different, you know, he's, he's still going to jump and grab that, you know. Uh, but like I say, there's going to be a lot of spinner baits going through the air. There's going to be a lot of swim baits, a lot of glide baits, a lot of that big fish stuff that, you know, yep, it'll catch a fish if you get it in front of the right one. But I'm going to throw stuff at him that he's not going to turn down. You know, uh, my jig's probably not going to be a great big one. You know, my jig's probably going to be a quarter or three eighths right now, even for that six and seven feet of water. Uh, just because it's kind of a natural thing, you know, when you lighten your lighten your jig up a little bit, um, put a crawdad on the back of it, and pitch it out there on a lighter, you know, a lighter head. Still stick with your heavy line, you know, uh, stick with twenty pound line, you know, because these fish are not line shy here uh, at all. They don't care, and uh, so pitch it out there on heavy line, that little quarter ounce jig, and it, yep. It's like watching paint dry sometimes to get it on down there on the bottom, especially if you get a 10 mile an hour wind blowing. But that keeps a bait in his strike zone that he is so much wants to eat. And if it looks good, he's going to eat it. He's going to eat that crawdad if it gets close to him. Um, I, I just think he's, you know, he's, he's a little bit easier fooled by a really good looking crawfish imitation, you know. Um, uh, take the time, paint that dude up, put some orange painters on the end of the claws, uh, you know, uh, maybe even a chartreuse on the belly of it. Um, you know, what people don't, what, you know, everybody wants to put a little something on their painters. Okay. And that, that does work. Okay. Making your crawdad painters a different color because the only thing a crawdad has in his defense is to throw those claws in the air right before he gets eaten. And if he looks at that crawdad and there's no color on the ends of them pinchers, he might think, oh, wait a minute, what's the matter with that son of a gun? Because there's no crawdad that swims in the lake of the Ozarks that doesn't have a different color right on the tips of these pinchers, okay? The other thing, he's greens and browns on the back, but his belly is almost a milky color, a real white, pearly kind of milky color. I achieve that by taking like a sharp my chartreuse marker and go down the belly of it and all you're doing is you're giving your bait some contrast dark on the back light on the belly and then the pinchers and now you've kind of got that fish fooled you know if he sees it as it's falling down through there real slow and easy and he sees the belly of it guess what it's supposed to be a lighter color you know um when i get it on the bottom i work it like i feel like a crawdad should be being worked you know 
I crawl it along the bottom. I don't do a lot of lifting my rod up because every time you lift your rod up, you pull that jig up off the bottom, okay? That's not how a crawdad crawls around. I mean, most of the time he spends his time creeping along the bottom. Them little legs are just working and just crawling along the bottom. When you pull it into something and you think, oh, I'm up against something, don't just reel down and lift up over it. Let it sit there for a few seconds. Let it hide. And what you're doing is you're imitating that crawfish hiding up against a rock or hiding up against a tree or something like that. You know, take that extra few seconds of time, let your bait sit there on the bottom. Another thing happens when you let it sit on the bottom. Those It allows those claws to lift up off of the bottom. And that's a very natural thing for that fish to see. And, uh, and like I say, when you're jacking with a big one, there's a reason Guido Hidden won big bass in most of the, in a lot of these tournaments. Out of the 40 years that he did this, he won big fish five or six times a year at least. And it's because he took the time to do what he knew those big bass were used to seeing, you know. Um, so he was a pretty, really slow fisherman. Oh, yeah. Slow. Yeah, he was, he was slow, but he was slow when he had to be, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't always have to work as slow. Sometimes when they're biting, you know, the quicker you get it in there and get it out of there, you know, you get reaction bites. The reaction bites in the big bass bash are going to be over in about two hours every morning, okay? <laughs> That's going to be through after that. You know, then them fish are going to wise up and go, uh-uh, no, I'm not biting that, you know, bait works Hibden jig. Not now. No, I've not seen one of them. That ain't happening, especially if it ain't doing the right thing. That's why a lot of times, like I say, I take a quarter ounce or three eighths ounce version, whatever the lightest you can get by with, you're going to get more bites. Simple as that. That's just the way it is. And that's this time of the year. This time of the year, the lighter you can go, the better off you're going to be. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time this time of the year with a three eighths being the heaviest one tied on in our whole boat, you know, and it's because I want that thing to float down through there real naturally. You know, and uh, and like I say, you just got to think about what that fish is used to seeing, you know, and fooling. When you catch that bass in the morning, look at him. I don't care if you catch a pound and a halfer. Look at his face. Look at his lips. If he's got them old red lips all around on there, you know, if his lips are really red all around it, that's because he's feeding in the rocks. That's because he's turning rocks over and he's going in there and he don't have hands. He, he don't have these. So the only way he gets to them crawdads is with this right here. <laughs> and he gets down there and he gets to kicking around in them rocks. That's why them spotted bass have always got them bright red lips. It's because they love them dang crawdads. Well, like I say, you get so fortunate enough to catch you a nice bat, you know, nice large mouth. Look at his lips. If his lips are got a little bit of red tinge around his lower lip and stuff like that, he's, he's chewing on crawdads. He's looking for them. You know, simple as that. Um, put him in your live well. You know, there's a lot of times, you know, in this big bash bash, the, one of the first things I tell, I have one son that can legally fish it, Connor, because he doesn't fish tournaments at all. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's one of the only tournaments that he really enjoys fishing. I think it's solely be because we don't jack with him. We just give him one of our boats and say, go get him, big guy. You know, and he doesn't have a brother or a dad telling him, hey, this is what you need to be doing. Him and one of his buddies go out there, they fish, uh, you know. But one of the first things I tell him is, I said, the first one you catch, put it in a live well. I said, I don't care if it don't weigh a pound and a half, put it in a live well. I said, because if you put him in a live well all by himself, normally within about 15 minutes, he's going to spit up what he's got in his belly. That tells you what's in his belly, you know. And yeah. if he's if he's full of shad, guess what? They're shad oriented. They're biting shad stuff right then, you know. Um, and God forbid you catch a great big one. You, you you catch a five or six pounder, you know. I I have many many times, you know, gagged a five or six pounder to see what he had in his belly, you know. Now no, you don't want to do that to big bass bash because you don't want him spitting it up. Right. But, but when I'm out there practicing. If I was practicing for a, a BASS tournament or something like that, and, and I caught a five-pounder during practice, oh, yeah, I stick that down his throat and make him throw up. He becomes a bulimic bass before I 
put him back in the lake. I won't see what he's eating, you know. Um, but like I say, you can tell that in other ways too. If he's got them old red lips. Guess what? He's digging. He's looking for stuff around them rocks and stuff. So when you're pulling your jig along and you pull it, oh, there's a rock. All right, that's when you just take a second, drop your line, just kind of give a little slack to it, and sit there and hold it for five seconds. Five seconds is an eternity with a fishing rod in your hand. Yep. You watch a really, really good slow fisherman, most time he'll take his hand off his reel. He'll just be holding on to his rod, and he'll take his hand away from his reel, and he'll just stand there and hold on to it. Because if you're touching the reel handle, it's spinning. You, you, you're going to move it. Mm-hmm. Five seconds is not that long. It just took me that long to sh- tell you to take your hand off the reel. Leave it set there for five seconds. It allows that crawdad to float up off the bottom a little bit. And that's a natural thing for that fish to see. And it's a trigger. You know, you're triggering him into going ahead and taking a hold of your bait. You know, uh, you know why do they bite a Cinco? Because when a Cinco sinks to the bottom, that little tail goes like that. That little tail just barely wiggles. When you get a generic Cinco that's too stiff, doesn't have that. Guess mm-hmm. what? Don't catch as many bass on it either. No. Simple as that. You know, and uh, and I I have to buy them 75 cent son of a guns just like everybody else does when I go to Bass Pro, <laughs> you know, them Yamamoto's. But it works better, you know, and, and the whole deal is, like I say, that little tail just quivering down to the bottom. That's something that, you know, those fish are, it's a trigger. It makes him swim up there to it he looks at it and that just makes him oh, grab it you know and yeah there, there's you're, that, you're you nailed it on that that slow you got to have confidence in the bait you're fishing to fish that slow um but you will get a lot more bites if you slow it there's so many times when same thing happens with a shaky head um you fish a shaky head really really slow a lot of times you just got a little slack in your line it's been sitting there for three four five seconds and all of a sudden the fish just picks it up if you'd have kept moving it, chances when are you, the fish would have just let it go by. When you leave that sit, shaky head set on the bottom, that worm is steadily doing this, mm-hmm. standing up. You that's know, right. and, and that that's and that's a very good and, and it's also a, a fine way for a bass to look down there. Oh, that minnow's feeding on the bottom. Guess what? That minnow's not doing. He's not paying attention to me. Right. You know, he's not just gonna dart away when I chase after him. He's got his head down feeding on the bottom on a shaky head. A shaky head, is that a cool way of catching them? It's an efficient way for a bass to bite your lure is what it is. If it's Texas rigged, a lot of times it lays down. You know, it's laid down this way and it it falls down because your hook drags it down. But on that shaky head, most all of them will stand up if you put the right worm on the back of it and that tail will just stand up off the bottom. And like I say, it's just a natural thing for a fish to see. Yeah. Just like a Carolina rig. A Carolina rig is a natural chase scene on the bottom of the lake. A bat, you know, a minnow is swimming along. It sees something kicking up the dust off the bottom, and it swims down there to eat whatever is getting kicked up off the bottom by that big old sinker. Oh, my goodness. It, it, here it is. It's a natural chase scene. The little minnow goes down there and investigate, and then a big old bass comes down there to investigate the same thing, and it's just a natural chasing it's a very natural thing for a bass to see in the water and and you know like i say common sense will catch you more bass than the greatest looking lure ever and and it's just you got to work it right you know work your stuff right uh you know in the bash you have to think about that type of stuff after the first couple hours because covering more water it's not going to do it for you. You know, there's certain times in certain lakes where, okay, I got to kick it into high gear, cover more water, hit more spots, and that's how I'm going to catch them. During the big bass bash on Lake of the Ozarks, you better not have that mentality because after the first hour, it don't matter how fast you fish, you're fishing behind somebody else, Mm -hmm. you know, so then I'm going to slow down and make my stuff look better, you know, um, you know, Got a couple uh, trailer trailer questions here. Uh, okay. couple, several right. several people are wanting to know what what are some of your go to crawl trailers. Well, I I still throw a Guido bug a lot. I mean it, that's that's the most natural thing for me, and I catch more big bass 
free spawn on a Guido bug than I do anything else hmm. than any other, any other rubber bait, you know, uh, Bojangles makes a couple of things that I like, but most of them are as the water temperature warms on up as the water temperature warms on up and I need some movement. Uh, there's some of them that, you know, that's got a good kick in action to them that I like right now. I don't want a whole lot of action. You know, I want that crawdad to do its deal, you know, because that's, like I say, watch for them red lips. And if it's red lips, guess what? He's eating crawfish off the bottom. Um, I throw, I throw both sizes. I throw the, the baby bug and the big, the middle size one. Uh, and I keep that pretty basic. If I can't see the bait, but about six, eight inches deep, then I'm going to throw black colors. And when I say black colors, I throw black. I mean, I don't throw a lot of different colors. I don't throw black and blue a ton. I throw black, you know, and I throw a black crawdad on the back of it. When I'm in the cleaner water, as the water clears up, I start throwing more natural colors, browns and greens, you know, but really for the most part, green pumpkin, you know, is going to go on the back of any of my jigs except the black one, you know. Uh, I keep that pretty basic, you know, because I don't, if you tried to match every color of crawdad that swims in Lake of the Ozarks, you would drive yourself completely batty. Because on any given minute, there's a dozen different color combinations of crawfish in Lake of the Ozarks. I know because I've went and caught them intentionally. You know, at, I've, I've caught them off the same shoreline, get, get out on the bank and turn over rocks and pick up a dozen crawdads. And when you lay them all on the front deck of the boat, every one of them is a different color. But in the end, they're all browns and greens. You know, they're all the same kind of. Uh, and they all have the same characteristics, you know, real pearly light colored on the belly, almost a milky looking color on the belly, greens and browns on the back, lots of pretty stripes and dark colors mixed in with them. A uh, little bit of orange or red on the tips of the pinchers. And, uh, but other than that, it, it's a crawdad, you know, it, like I say, if you, if you tried to match every different color of green pumpkin crawdad, you see, like I say, there's not enough, Bojangles doesn't have enough rubber to make all the different colors, but green pumpkins are pretty solid. That's a pretty basic color that you can manipulate with some, some, a chartreuse marker and an orange marker. And you can make your, you can make your crawdad look pretty dang special to them. If you're using silicone skirts on your jigs, just make sure that the dark colors on the back, you know, the dark colors on the back, light colors on the belly. And when I say the back, I'm talking where the weed guard comes out. Where the weed guard comes out, that's the back of the jig, not the belly, not the part that's down on the bottom, okay? And just, you know, like I say, somebody that gets paid minimum wage to string that deal up on there in that jig is not taking the time to put the black on the, the dark color on the back and the light color on the belly, all right? So when you pull a jig out of the package, even if it is a hidden hammer, guess what? <laughs> Minimum wage workers string those on. I'm not saying nothing bad about minimum wage workers. They just don't care if you catch a fish or not. I do. So make sure the dark colors on the back, light colors on the belly. And just make it look right. You know, you're fishing for a $100,000 bass. You know, you don't want him to swim down there and look at your crowd and go, eh, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. You know, make it look right. Take, take a few seconds with rigging your jig and make it look right. You know, so what about it, dead sticking? Dexter Dexter says, How often should we try dead sticking? So when you're fishing a jig or shaky head, do you typically start out moving it faster and slow down, or do you start slow and move it faster? And then and then when does something like dead sticking come into play? Well, dead dead sticking to me, I, I'm gonna dead stick my jig probably 10 times a cast. Anytime I touch something, when I pull it along and I'm easing it along real easy and I pull it up against something, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it, give it a few seconds, you know, because you can only, you, you got to imagine that one's chasing it or one's looking around that log that you just pulled your jig into. He's hunting, he's there, he's looking for it. So it's not going to take him long to find it, especially if he hears it, you know, and, and it comes crawling in there. But like I say, just pull it into that stick or that log, something that makes you have to raise your rod tip up that warrants me to let it set for a few seconds, 
okay? That on Lake of the Ozarks, that's a rock, piece of concrete, you know, whatever. If you pull it to where you think a crawdad would hide, let it set for a few seconds, you know? And, and like I say, four or five seconds, that's an eternity to let one set. But when fishing's tough, make that fish bite your bait. You know, don't don't just throw it out there and come bobbing your rod tip up and down because when you do, your bait's swimming up off the bottom a lot. And that's another thing with that quarter ounce and three eighths ounce jig. It's easily up off of the bottom. A crawfish, if you watch one in a, in a minnow tank or something like that, he's not real staunch on the bottom. He kind of floats around real easy, but he does it all real lightly. Them little legs just crawl him along. And, and uh, so, you know, if your jig's, you know, a half ounce or a five eighths ounce and it's just dead on the dang bottom, that's kind of unnatural for him for him to see. You know, he, he, he floats around mm-hmm. kind of like a ballerina on the bottom of the lake, you know, like ballerina crawdad. See, we're going into something brand new here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just making this stuff up. No, I'm kidding. No, but so you know what? Good? Mo- moving, moving the, you kind of touched on something that's, uh, I watched a video oh, about a month ago, but a guy had underwater footage and he would cast a bait out like a jig and he would show your rod tip and he would move his rod tip, you know, different distances and he would show what the bait was doing. And even moving your rod like six inches up in the air, that makes that bait move a lot further yeah. than what you realize. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really does. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not the same six inches on the in the water. No, you pull your rod tip up six inches, it flows a couple feet yes. down through there. Right. Uh, right. And the longer the long, you know, the length of the rod makes a big yes, difference too. So absolutely. there's all these little variables. So you may Everybody think you're is, only moving that bait two inches, yep. but it may be going two feet. I sometimes drag mine to the side. You know, I don't always hold my rod up like this. There's a lot mm-hmm. of times I hold my rod at a good position to set the hook and I drag it sideways. You know, I just kind of drag it sideways. That way I'm not lifting that rod up. You know, there's times where I just reel my reel hound just ever so slow, just real easy, just creeping along. Because every time you man- manipulate that rod, all, all of us have gotten so big and, you know, seven and a half foot rods and, seven threes and seven twos and stuff like that and guess what you know you just move your bait too much simple as that you know back in back in the old uh kentucky barkley days everybody wondered why billy bill and billy schroeder used a pistol grip rod to do their stroking of a jig because they didn't move it so much they used a six foot pistol grip rod and they weren't jerking at seven eight foot off the bottom they're just lifting it up, pulling it a few feet. And, and it, you know, that's just the way they did it. You know, now everything's so big, you got to consider, you know, how much am I moving my lure on the bottom of the lake? It's pretty easy this time right now to get out of one strike zone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. And, and, and when you get out of your strike zone, especially with 3,800 people out there, guess what? He's probably not going to chase your lure a long way because he's already heard all the trolling motors and, and stuff like that. So he's going to be standing around whatever piece of cover he wants to stand around, and he's not going to be moving three or four feet to eat your bait. Stephanie asked, uh, do you think the person in the back of the boat should fish the same lure the person in the front is catching on? Uh, you know, on any given day, it depends. On, is that That's a that's a good question, it you is. know, because, Tough one. yeah, that is a good question. Um, you know, not always. Uh, they they got to be biting pretty good before I'm going to follow somebody down the bank throwing the same bait. And when I say they got to be biting pretty good, he's going to have to be, whoever's in the front of the boat has is going to have to be really significantly catching a lot more bass, you know, like three to my one or something like that. Uh, you know, anytime you're fishing on the bottom, you know, you got a few good bottom baits. You know, a shaky head is a great bottom bait. Uh, you know, a Carolina rig is a good bottom bait. Um, you know, Carolina rig's kind of a thing of the past. People just don't do it anymore. You know, oh, you know, we drop shot and we do this, we do that. Well, man, a basic old Carolina rig just stomps a mud hole in them on any given day. And and as far as my co-anglers over the years, 
I've had way, way more ass whoopings on a Carolina rig than I ever have any other type of lure, okay? Or a shaky head. If your guy's throwing a jig a bunch, put your shaky head out there uh, with a little straight worm on it. Or uh, we got a little creature bait called a bow hog. Stuff like that, you know, some little creature bait maybe. Um, you know, because you want something good and bulky and you want it down on the bottom. But still, you don't want it just thundering around down there. You want it to be kind of light and delicate, you know. So, so no, I'm not going to, you know, if somebody's out fishing me a bunch, then, yeah, I'm probably going to throw similar baits uh, because, you know, he's not going to catch them all, you know. But, like I say, if it's just a real close ratio to where, oh, he's, he's caught two more than me, eh, no, I'm probably going to throw something different most of the time, you know, because – you don't want a little handful of fish, you know, seeing the same thing every time it comes by the tree or every time by the log uh, or through that pile of brush. Um, I used to, I, there used to be a co-angler that fished from down at Smith Lake, Alabama. And, and it really kind of always bothered me when I drawed him. Super nice guy. But he would never face the front of the boat when you fish shallow. And the reason he did that is because he didn't want to throw at the same piece of cover that he knew you had just made multiple casts to. So he would watch kind of what you threw. He'd never throw the same bait, but he would kind of face kind of back. He'd keep his back to you somewhat. And why he did that is because when he, that log come to his end of the boat, he would pick up a different lure and throw to the same log also at a different angle. He's actually bringing his across at a different angle. And sometimes if a fish is really tight on a piece of wood or something, angles everything, you know, because you can be pulling it where he's not even seeing it good. And you change that angle and throw to it from another angle, guess what? You might be pulling it right into his face where he can see it better. So, so yep. to answer your question, he would have to be really out fishing me hard before I throw the same bait, you know. Probably three to one, four to one, something like that. If it's two to one, no, I'm probably going to keep on throwing what I'm throwing, you know, and, and just try not to throw exactly the same thing he is. Hey, um, Steph Stephanie, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you two cents as, as a, as a co-angler that fishes out of the back of the boat quite often. Um, couple, couple things that I've learned over the years is <clears throat> if a guy up front is throwing an a rig or a jerk bait and he's not getting the feedback sometimes the fish are on the bottom and you can you can throw in the same areas that he's going through and not getting feedback or if he's getting smaller fish you can drag something like a jig and pick up some bites behind him another thing that happens a lot is mm -hmm. maybe he is throwing a jig he's coming through an area and it looks it looks good it looks right but he's not getting bites you can throw a shaky head or vice versa. If he's throwing a shaky head, sometimes you can throw a jig. Sometimes you can downsize your jig. Um, and then like what Dion said, that angle is so important. I had a, I have a Kentucky Lake BFL video coming out probably next week. I got the practice coming out tomorrow with Darius, but in that, in that, uh, in that BFL, I caught a couple fish behind my boater off of lay downs that he had just, just fished. Um, he was flipping, he was flipping a jig and I was throwing a shaky head but as he's coming to the laydown, he's fishing the front side of it. And as he gets past, nobody's nobody's fished the back side of it because he's already looking to the next one. Well, I've caught a lot of fish flipping to that back side because it's a totally different angle, like you're talking about. You're getting a you're getting a totally different angle. He's up there messing with the wind and the trolling motor and stuff. So things are moving a lot faster for him. So he's getting his you know, the first look at stuff, which most of the time, nine times out of the 10, he's going to catch the, the more aggressive fish with that first look. But when you're in the back of the boat, you got to look for those spots that he misses. And, and nine times out of 10, he doesn't, he doesn't get up there and throw back towards you to hit that back side of that lay down. So you usually got that to yourself. Um, you just got to, sometimes you kind of got to hold your fire and not waste your time on that spot that he's just fished and just wait for him to pass and flip in there on the back side. So that's something I would do, Stephanie, for sure, is uh, look at where the person in the front of the boat is fishing 
try to make a cast to a little bit different spot. And if it is a jig bite, uh, there's been mil- multiple times when I've been in the boat and it is a jig bite. If you're not throwing a jig, you're not getting bit. And I, and I'll go through my confidence rotation of stuff like a shaky head. I like a tube, a, a stupid tube. I catch a lot of fish behind people with a stupid tube, but there's times when the jig is the deal. So instead of throwing the exact same jig that that person is throwing, Maybe, maybe finesse it out a little bit or go the other way. Maybe go really heavy. If, if he's throwing a, a three eighths or a half, you might go three quarter or you might go, uh, you know, a quarter somewhere in between, maybe change your trailer size, just do something a little bit different. Maybe go, uh, put it on a little bit lighter rod, you know, a little bit lighter line. Um, say, say he's throwing something heavy, like 18 pound test, put it on a 12 pound test, go a lighter jig on 12 pound test. It's going to have a, like you said, it's going to have a different glide action. I, I swear by that in the wintertime, especially with a shaky head. Um, I catch a lot of fish on an eighth ounce shaky head. It's it's painfully slow, but eight pound test and an eighth ounce shaky head because you pull it up and it just kind of it just glides real soft. And I think instead of something digging in the bottom, I think there's something real natural about that kind of that gliding action. And it, I, I've had days where, you know, I just went from a quarter ounce to an eighth ounce and, and go from not catching any fish to catching fish. Just a little, little simple thing like that. So yeah, Stephanie, just uh, look for those look for those spots that the guy in the front boat has. Little subtle made. changes too make a huge difference. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if your guy, if whoever you're in the boat with is getting some bites and they're, oh man, I missed one, or he, oh he pulled my trailer off or something like that, don't make major changes. You know, just make little subtle changes because the fish that he just missed wanted it bad enough that he bit it, but there was something about it that it just wasn't quite perfect, you know? So, you know, make subtle changes a lot of times when you're following somebody, uh, you know, just, just think about something. Okay. What, why did that fish spit out his bait, you know, and make little tiny changes, you know, like you say, go from a three eighths to a quarter, you know, go to, you know, go to a little bit bigger trailer, Sometimes smaller is not better. Sometimes bigger is what they want, you know. And, uh, you know, because the bigger the trailer, it slows your slows your fall down, you know. Uh, you know, so make little subtle changes. Don't make big, big drastic changes, you know, a lot of times. Just, you know, because if he's biting it at all, he wanted it com- somewhat. There's just something that wasn't quite perfect to make him go ahead and put it down his throat and eat it, you know. So little subtle changes. You know, don't throw exactly the same thing. If if neither one of you is catching them, till you figure them out, keep trying different stuff, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I don't care if I'm fishing against that guy, you know. I uh, I made the Bassmasters Classic through the Invitationals four times, you know, and that's fishing with a fellow pro, you know, in, in that series of tournaments. And, uh, you know, I, I just, until somebody catches one, it's a practice day. You know, don't throw the same thing, you know, mix it up a little bit, change it up till one of you gets something going, you know, keep changing it up. You go out there in the big bass bash, if you ain't getting bit, change it up. You know, both of you throw something different for a little bit. Uh, most of the time, Lake of the Ozarks is such a good lake, you know, you don't have to throw it 10 minutes and you're going to know if they're going to bite it, you know, uh, you know, so just don't be afraid to get out and retie, you know, uh, my little cubby hole on the front corner of my Camus up there. I mean, at the end of the day, it looks like I dumped a tackle box out up there sometimes. And, uh, you know, and, but for the days out, I'm going to find the one that they want, you know, and I'm going to find the the right little wiggle of the right crankbait that they wanted better, you know, and you just have to keep changing it up sometimes, you know, even for us, it's not an exact science, you know, <laughs> you know, I wish it was, you know, uh, and yes, it does seem like for certain anglers in the world, yeah, it's an exact science. No, it's not. It's not. You just, you know, you just got to keep trying different things. And and uh, my things, my things, a jig. You know, that's why I like to fish. You know, is is I like to fish because I grew up throwing a jig. Uh, when I'm out there on the water and I'm having a tough day, I don't change from a jig. I just change up my jig. And, you know, and it's because I have so much confidence in it that I will keep switching and making those little subtle changes 
till I land on the one that they absolutely want. And when that happens, then it's game on. Then, it, then they're all in big trouble. You know, they better not let that happen by noon because if it happens before noon, my fat butt's going to catch them, you know. And, and, and it's just, it's one of those deals. When you're out there fishing, Denny Brower told me one time when I fished with him, he said, you'll never win a tournament doing something you're not good at. He said, accidents can happen, but he said, that's what it is. He said, if you're good at it, you know when to switch, when to change, when to lighten your presentation up, when to make your jig heavier or something else. And that's why guys like him, you know, he made his living with a jig. That's why my dad made his living with a jig. They chose the bait that they felt like bass eat more than anything else or that they will eat in any condition. And that's a crawdad. You know, a crawdad is not something that a bass will turn down. Simple as that. Where a shad, there's millions of those, and they're everywhere. Guess what? Every now and then, a bass is going to say, now, I am sick of shad. I am not having another one. But I don't think he ever says that to a jig. I think when he sees a, sees a crawdad on the bottom, he's like, oh, there's a little morsel for me, and he eats it. And, and that's why, like I say, there's been a few anglers around the world and in time that have just, that's, that's the most sure thing that, you know, I've, I've found over the years. That, that was one of the questions I had wrote down was, do you think, you know, I know, I know fish get accustomed to sound. Like it's not uncommon for them to, uh, after they've heard a thousand rattle traps or lipless crankbaits come through the grass, they kind of shy away from them. Certain spinner baits they don't like, and they're, you know, crankbaits, things that, things that make noise. Um, do you think they ever get conditioned to a jig? Oh, yeah, they can. Absolutely. They, can. they can't hear. You know, they can't hear on like the Ozarks when you got the fishing pressure like we have. Uh, yeah, they can get conditioned. But less so than like a rattle bait or something that's real loud. Yeah, probably. yeah, less less than obnoxious baits, yeah. You mm -hmm. know, I think I think any more that, a, that an A-rig, just for instance. Yeah. You know, right. an A-rig, an A-rig there for a few years, you know, if you weren't throwing it, you were going to get beat by it from February through April. Okay. Once April shows, shows up, then you can get on the bank and they're going to eat some crawdads. All right. Even in March, they eat crawdads too, but you got to get the right day, you know, the right sunshiny day to pull the crawfish out. But, but can you go out on a calm day right this minute and throw an A-rig and win? No, you cannot. It's got to be the perfect day now. You got to have either one of them 40-mile-an-hour windy days that's just crashing in on them big rock banks to win on an A-rig. And I think it's nothing more than everybody has wore the shiny off of that deal to where now those big ones are just kind of like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, and, and I really believe that. You know, this year there was more tournaments won back again on like a jerk bait, mm -hmm. you know, early, early spring. And I really think they're just tired of seeing that chandelier coming through there with all those danglies and wigglies and, and spinners and, and, you know, different swim baits and all that different stuff. Uh, was there still tournaments won on it? Absolutely. Only on the perfect days, the perfect days when the wind was blowing so hard. You know, stuff like that. Uh, and, and it's nothing more than, yep, they got conditioned to it. You know, I yeah, hate to right. say it, but an, but, but an A-rig is one of those baits. Anybody can do it. There's absolutely, I can take a five-year-old kid and he can catch as many on an A-rig as a 45-year-old athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, if he can get his lure in the water, he can catch just as many as a professional angler on it. And when that happens... When you give them something like that that's, that's just that universal, they eventually wear it out. And, and I really believe, you know, that they have wore it down now, you know. Um, and everybody thought forward-facing sonar, well, that's going to bring back the A-Rig. No, <laughs> no, it's not because <laughs> they're still used to seeing it, you know, and they're going to shy away from it some, you know. Yep, on any given day, you get the right day, you can catch fish on it. But a jig is one of those baits, it's a crawdad. And if you take the time to make it look like a crawdad, 
that he's used to eating, and you work it right on the bottom of the lake, no self-respecting bass is going to turn it down. And, and I've always believed that. And guess what? It's what you believe is just as important as what you throw a lot of times. Yeah. You got to have the confidence, you know, and, and I, I, I do, I have the confidence. And, and like I say, and I just, I truly believe I always have, uh, I work in a tackle store part-time and I take a crawdad over every now and then drop it in the fish tank with that little bass and makes all the difference in the world. He won't let it live. He's going to eat it as soon as it gets in the water. Guess what? I can only imagine that all the little wild bass out there are the same way. And, and I believe, you know, simple as that. Uh, 3,800 feet. What about a mojo rig? There's mojo couple, rig? You start talking about Carolina rig, and then there's some people, so, several people start talking about a mojo rig. And that's, a, mojo, that's one of mojo those. Rig is, mojo rig to me is what I would throw now. That's. Yeah. That's my rig for now. It's not a Carolina a nest, rig. It's, basically it's a really nest. Carolina rig kind of. Yeah, it's it's a mojo rig is what I would throw now. Uh and I throw it on a big spinning rod. I throw it on a seven and a half foot spinning rod, 20 pound braid, and uh it's so I can lay it right next to those docks. I can lay it next to a piece of cover. Um, uh, you know, and and I still want it to be subtle because I'm only gonna be in that five to six foot range mm -hmm. is where I feel like the fish are gonna be. Now, if I'm out there in 10 foot of water, then I'm probably going to throw a one ounce egg sinker because it doesn't make any difference. You know, you're just getting it down there on the bottom and it's dragging, you know, your lizard around. So, but like right now, it's it's a mojo rig is what I throw. They still bite a lizard? Still bite a lizard. Well, there's you so many. Uh, there's brush hauls and all these other things. I didn't think they bit a lizard anymore. Shoot, man. They ain't never going to replace a lizard. I mean, hey, and I'm sorry, but I, I, I guide quite a little bit, and yeah, no, you ain't replacing the lizard, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, Lawson and Dirk fished this weekend, and he throwed one of those uh, creature, creature hogs, bow hog, mm -hmm. on his, and it's just a, it's a, it's a creature bait with ribs is all it is. But yeah, well, I was saying could, that. Could you know, could he have caught him on a lizard? Yeah, if you'd have thrown it. If you'd have thrown a lizard, he'd have caught him on a lizard. But that's right. the first thing he tied on. Mm -hmm. You know. That old lizard's good, man. I oh it's, hey, it's a sleeper bait because nobody me. uses it anymore. It's nobody got a certain glide it. to it that most yep. things don't have. And I go from a lizard straight to a French fry. Hey, I'm a big fan of the French fry too. French fry will catch as big a bass that swims in the lake. Yep. That is a little minnow, is all it is. A little yeah. tiny minnow. And like I said, it's kind of like the little jig. That's just something, if it gets around him, he's going to jump and grab it. You know, he's going to jump and eat it, you know, so. It doesn't, it doesn't freak them out. You know, it's no, it's no subtle. No. There's no negative cues to, nope. to a French fry or straight tail worm like that. Nope. If it floats by and he's within eyesight of it, he will suck it in and eat it, you know. You know yeah. There's nothing intimidating about it. It's just a little minnow going by and you watch a fish in a fish tank. They're so cool to watch. I've sat and watched them off of boat docks before. Just sit, see them standing there by a piece of styrofoam. And, and most of their feeding is not vicious. It's not just run out and chase and run around. Most of it, they're just standing there, mouth closed, standing by a piece of styrofoam, and something, you know, a minnow goes paddling by or a shad goes paddling by, and it's a foot in front of them. And they just open their mouth up and suck it in. It's just, it's just gone. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, you know, like I say, I think everybody doesn't really, you really need to watch a bass. Watch one. Watch the way he feeds. He doesn't like to do a lot of swimming around and stuff. He waits till something swims to him, you know. And another reason why I like to throw a jig. I, I like to get it right in there to him, you know, wherever he's living and, and make him make a decision, you know. Hook's got a question for me. He says, Gabe, what length rod do you like throwing your underspins on? Should I go to longer than a seven foot or am I overthinking it? Um, the hook, man, a seven foot medium heavy is hard to beat for an underspin. Uh, 12 to 15 pound test. I, I like fluorocarbon 
And typically I'm throwing a quarter to a three eighths ounce underspin and, you know, like a three to four inch swim bait, you know, like a, sometimes I'll throw a, just a fluke, like a zoom super fluke on an underspin. Sometimes I'll throw like a three inch, um, hogs custom make makes a little, uh, swimmer or skinny, the little dipper reaction innovation, little dipper is another one. I like, um, some of your little Kai techs, but three to 3.8 inch is probably my go-to on, uh, underspins. Now I have thrown, um, I've got a, it's a Virtus swim jig rod at seven foot two that I've thrown, uh, an underspin on and it works great too. But you know, seven to seven foot two is probably all you need in 12 to 15 pound tests. And like, like you said in the comment below, don't, don't overthink it, man. It, you, you just need something that loads up. And if it's, if it's getting it out there, then I would stick with what you got. <clears throat> and another thing, that's important with an underspin is any in, in any swim bait is when you feel that fish bite it, don't set it. You're not slack lining them. It's not a jig bite. <clears throat> it's just a kind of reel and sweep because if you start setting really hard, you're going to miss a lot of fish and it is frustrating because a lot of times you feel that bite, you feel them come up behind it and you feel them tick it and you want to just do this and you'll jerk it right out of their mouth. I don't, I don't know exactly what's going on, but the, the kind of a sweep type set when you sweep and it loads up, then you can give them the juice, you know, but make sure you get, make sure you feel that fish is guided and loaded up. Um, that's, that's my tips on the, on an underspin. Two, two stiffer rods going to miss you a lot of fish. That's right. That's a, that's a good point too. You want something soft that loads up and any let, kind of a chatter bait, it. spinner bait, anything that's moving like that, a crank bait, you want, you want that rod to load up a little bit. If you're throwing, if you, in this day and age, if you're throwing baits out there with bad hooks in them, shame on you because you can buy the sharpest damn hooks on the planet. And like I say, what that allows you to do is just, it allows you to screw up. You know, you, you don't have to set the hook. I mean, it, they're so sharp, you know, and on a bait like that where you're in constant contact with it, a little bit lighter action ain't going to hurt you. You know, I throw a medium to a medium heavies about it, about it for mine. Yeah, you got a pretty good hook on that uh, Hibden hammer jig too, don't you? That's a jig. A little bit different situation. You're going to set the hook on that most of the time. You know, so in order to sell them, and is that the only hook style that I use? No, not at all. I use a lighter wire a lot of times. Uh, do I? Could I sell a lighter wire? Yeah, I could in certain parts of the world, uh, but for the most part, when you rig a jig up to sell it, it's got to have a fairly sturdy hook in it because most guys won't differentiate a swim jig, you know, from a casting jig, you know. And uh, But the nice thing about our jig, it is a hook that penetrates easy. That's the whole idea in, the, in, in our jig. If you throw a Hibden's hammer jig, uh, you're going to hook about 99% of them. It's just... It, we rigged them. We rigged them solely for my wife about three years ago. My, you know, Peyton and Lawson rigged that jig so my wife could fish in the Thursday night tournaments with that hook because it hooks them so effortlessly. And once we realized how easily it did hook them, then we started putting it in a heavier wire and a bigger jig and and bigger hooks and stuff like that. And uh, and it still amazes me the one that she throws, how she just stabs them. I mean, right through the bone and the top of the head, ninety nine percent of the time, and, and and she don't jerk her at all. She just whines, you know. And, and it just the the hook angle, everything about it is right, you know. Simple as that. And uh, that won the bass, didn't it? A couple well, last year, a year before, something like yeah, that. Yeah, year before last. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they got yeah, them. Up, they got them at bait works. So you see yeah. that. That scroller there, THM 10 gets you 10% off of Baitworks. You can go get it's, you some uh it's just a really, you know, it, it's it's a really good hook for catching catching fish, you know. And it's heavy enough, you're not gonna straighten it out on 25 pound line. The only time you're gonna straighten it out is if you get hung on a rock and you know, braid or something like that. So here's a here's a good question from Bassman. This is something I've always wondered. Um Dion, do you think they get off of a jig and on plastics during the spawn? Sure. 
Yes, they can. Uh, but I let them tell me that. Okay. I, I go out there. I go out there every day with the intentions of catching them on a jig. Uh, but it only takes me about four or five bites of them um, pecking it, you know, and missing it or not hanging, not hanging on to it before I'm going to switch up to, you know, like a, a bow hog or a, or a tube even, you know, you, you comment on a tube, man, a tube's hard to beat. They're just a tube. A lot of times that time of the year, they just like it. They like to eat it, you know, and, and, and when I say a tube, I'm talking, you know, 20 pound line, four aught, you know, HP style hook and five sixteenth sinker, you know, nothing finesse about it. I'm talking just a tube, you mm-hmm. know, I, I like them big fat ones too. There's sometimes my tubes six inches long, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I let the fish tell me that. I go out there every day with the intentions of catching more jig. And, uh, but I got that other stuff in the boat because I know that if they start pecking around at it and munching around on it and not getting it, and, you know, or if you set the hook and you miss one or something like that, or, or you set the hook and you pull him five feet and he comes off guess what he didn't quite get it all he didn't want it that good and and i'm only going to let that happen a couple of times before i'm going to change up throwing something similar but different you know so yeah that's a good question absolutely jt edwards has a comment he says dion is it true you're writing a romance novel called 50 shades of green pumpkin uh you know i thought about that oh I don't want everybody to know my kinks. I'm just going to tell you that right now, you know, and, and, you know, some of, that, man. some of that stuff's a little private, you know, and, and I'm really appalled that he even asked. Um, my dad, my dad, before my dad died, Peter T got to call him the candy man because every bait he got, we could walk in a tackle store in, uh, in Florida and if they had something green pumpkin candy, he was going to buy that. And then he got, well, you're in Florida, Dad. Maybe you ought to get some June bug, you know. Oh, okay. You know, and he, and, but I mean, me and Dad, we, we're, we're pretty hard on that, you know, but they called him the candy man. They called him the candy man because he just <laughs> loved green pumpkin candy. He thought when they put that green flake in there and, and, and purple flake, he thought, Holy crap! That might be the ultimate fishing lure ever built, you know. <laughs> and uh, and it, it was it was it was funny. To hey, be you're not to. wrong though. That's a good color. Oh no, it's always good. It's a good. I mean, it's it's just a good common color. <laughs> well, if you ever if you ever write that novel, I'm make not sure writing that, uh, that novel. Okay, I've got to keep some stuff to myself. All right, I understand. When I say green pumpkin, you know, and a lot of people, I get asked that question a lot. Well, what about green pumpkin red? What about green pumpkin green? That really doesn't matter. That that's your choice. Whatever you like to mix it up with, do it. But green pumpkin's the main color, you know, right? Am I wrong on that? Yep. There's lots of lots of people like green pumpkin red. And green pumpkin red is a beautiful color. And on any given day, if I walk into the store and I'm looking for green pumpkin candy. And they don't have it, and they've got green pum- pumpkin red. Well, I'm probably going to walk out of that store. But anyways, no, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm a green pumpkin purple guy. I really don't think it makes that big a difference. Yeah. You know, that's you know, if that bass is, you know, I, and and I've always said it, you know, to all my buddies, I'm looking for them older ones, anyways. Their eyesight can't be that freaking good. You know, them six ten pounders, their eyes are getting glassed over and kind of <laughs> funky and. You know, so as long as it's green, green pumpkin, it's fine. You I know. like that old one-eyed fish. That's my favorite. That's right. Yeah. There ain't nothing like a blind one. You yeah. know, I catch a blind one. I feel like, oh, my God, that's pretty damn lucky. Yeah. Got on the right side of that one, you know. <laughs> they weigh the same. That's right. Exactly the same. Yeah, that's, you know, my dad said that. He says, you know, you know, there's between the five-pound smallmouth, five-pound largemouth. He says, absolutely nothing at the scales, <laughs> you true. know. And, uh, you know, there was one time we were at Lake Champlain and he says, oh, you had a big smallmouth in there. I said, yep, I took what you said to heart. I said, I caught a five pound smallmouth and it weighed just as much as in five pound largemouth. He said, that's right. He said, they all weigh the same. I think the, I think them smallmouth are prettier though. Oh, they are. They're pretty. Yeah. 
I don't like catching them smallmouth up there because they tear up my grass beds. Yeah, and they, know, they're kind of you, they're, they're wily too. Yeah, when you're in the north, they go sideways and tear up your grass beds and they'll ruin a milfoil patch. Joe's got a great comment. He says, Dion, tell Bo to make a bow lizard. A bow lizard. Yeah. D does, does, that might be the missing link. Now, this is Joe who? Joe Wild. How you say his name? Will Haber? Wild Joe, Haber? Joe, we have a lizard. You do? I just haven't sold it. Sorry, yet. Joe, I we butchered do. your last name. I'm not, I'm not selling it to you just yet, Joe. But we have that stuff, okay? Oh. We, we're, we're just, is it in one of those 50 shades of green, too? Yes, it is. There, there will be a couple of green pumpkins, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yes, we have lizards. We're, we're making lizards. Bo, Bo can only make so much stuff it's in so such a short length of time because him and Lawson actually spend too much damn time on the water fishing. So, Which aggravates hell out of me because I don't get many good baits out of the deal. Mm -hmm. but, well you know when you get them they're proven though and they're gonna that's them right first. they actually know how to catch them all right well let's let's talk a little more about the bash here um we're just gonna do our predictions we've done this several times now and i don't think we i don't think we've ever nailed it we've been close we've been close um what do you think the weight's gonna be and then what do you think the bait's gonna be so weight and bait. I think I, it'll be I got my prediction too. So I think it'll be over eight pounds this year. I really, really? do. There okay. are so many big ones being caught. Uh I, I just I think you know, I think the odds are just in in favor of a great big one happening this year. Um you know, there are just tons and tons of six and seven pounders being caught, you know, and and like I say. I know of about four different ones over eight so far this year. Um, we saw some big ones last fall. You know, when I was fishing flat boat docks and stuff last fall, I saw some giants, you know, and, and when I say giants, I know what a big one looks like, you know, and, and I saw some fish of that caliber, you know, a time or two. Uh, so they're here. They, they didn't go nowhere. They had a good mild winter, and now they're fatter than ever right now. Uh, and they're, they're catching the bash at the time where these fish are as healthy as they've been ever during the bash, I think. Uh, you know, you, you, I, I sat and watched that anglers in action weigh in and, and, uh, and, you know, every time one of them ones over six pounds was weighed in, it was just like so round and beautiful, you know, so, so I think they've really hit it hit it right to where it's going to be, it's going to be big this year. I think it'll be over eight. Um, so what, eight and a quarter, eight and a half, eight and three quarters? Oh, it'll be eight, eight and a quarter, something like that. Okay. It takes a big bass in the north to weigh eight and a half. You know, have I seen them? Yep. Yeah, I've seen 10 pounders out of here. You know, actually quite a few of them over the years, you know. But, you know, eight, eight and a quarter, because they get smart. They get smart. They're oh, not yeah. they're not the easiest one to catch. When they get that big, they get pretty intelligent, you know. But so I'm writing you down at eight point two five. There you go. That's fine with me. That sounds good. Okay. We're going eight point two five. And then what's that fish gonna be caught on? A jig. A jig. Okay. A jig of some configuration. Okay. Green pumpkin ish. Uh depends on where they're at. Green pumpkin or black. Okay. All right. You I'm can't right. rule out you can't rule out black and blue because everybody's so brainwashed on black and blue. You yeah. Know, you know, when when they send 3800 3, anglers out there, uh I guarantee you out of 3800, 3000 of them will have black and blue and tied on. All right. <laughs> so, and if you tell them, And if you tell them straight black, they're all like I don't have any trailers that are straight black. You know, they I got black blue flake or I got black red flake. But no, no, it'll be black of some form or fashion. Hey, that black's underutilized. I just had a, I just, oh. I was just talking to my buddy Del Colvin down at Bull Shows, and and uh, he said, I told him I caught him really good on a wacky rig the other day, and he said, Were you throwing a black Cinco? I said, No, I was throwing a green pumpkin purple. He's like, You need to throw black. I said, Black? 
He goes, yeah, trust me. Stole Black Cinco. Nobody talks about it. All those black, years. Black's underutilized. All those years at Beaver Lake, you know, that FLW went to Beaver Lake. The black shake he had all the time. Yeah. I mean, a lot. Not not just not just every now and then. No, every year it ended up being, you know, about half the fish you'd catch be on a black one, you know. So yeah. Black shaky head too. Uh Ren Ren Lake's a lake not too far from us. Um, I know I know a lot of money's been won on a black shaky head, like either Texas rig, uh, a black, a black trick type worm, black straight tail worm, either shaky head or Texas rig. But if I had to make the only variance to that, you know, if it's not a jig, it'll be on a shaky head with something on it. Okay. You know, one of those two baits, I think, is what'll win. Uh, you know, and, and that's just that's what they want to eat when they get up there shallow. They want to eat something on the bottom a lot of times. So that's well, you my wanna, opinion. You want you want to know mine? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, I originally had 6.93, but after hearing <clears throat> you and, and Al say eight, I'm going to bump it up to uh, 7.63 is going to be my, my weight, which is a huge bass regardless. That's a big one. That's a big one. And I think it's going to be caught. Man, it's, it's so hard. A jig's – I guarantee half of the weight – half of the check fish could be weighed in on a jig for sure because for the reasons you mentioned a lot of people's going to be throwing it and it's such a good jig and it's that time of year to throw a jig and uh i mean heck if you can skip it the further you can skip that sucker back underneath the dock maybe the better chance you got because i think a lot of them bigger fish are gonna gonna get way way back in those shadows and hide out but I, i'm gonna man i'm i'm gonna go with a uh a spinner bait i think it's just i want to go glide bait Cause I know that's the obvious, you know, if you throw, if you throw a glide bait around for however many hours for two days, chances are you're going to have the opportunity to catch a fish. But I think, uh, I just got this feeling that somebody's going to get away from everybody. They're going to be up there around that 90 mile marker. They're going to be throwing a big old fat, nasty, you know, spinner bait. And, uh, they're going to bring back a seven pound, six, three, whatever. So I'm going, I'm writing down spinner bait. And I'm just going to go white and chartreuse. We'll there's, see a, there's another thing that's playing this year that hasn't been in the years past, and that's a lot more dirty water. The water, the water overall is a lot dirtier in a lot of the, the bulk of the lake, you know, uh, you know, up the river, the water's dingy, you know, and when I say up the river, I'm talking, you don't have to go very far up there and it stains up pretty quick. The Nianguas are dirty, uh, you know, so so I think that's going to definitely help out with the jig bite and stuff like that. Well, okay, so that Aaron brought something up, and this is this is something I had written down, and this is this is like sign of the times. Um, do you think that it will be one using forward facing sonar or traditional? And th and this is a lake that it could definitely be one either way some lakes it's going to be obvious yeah one's going to come into play over the other but with all the docks you know that and, and the time of the year that can that can kind of neutralize the forward facing sonar bite so what what do you what's your opinion on that you think uh you think no. this is wild forward facing sonar or not they're too they're too far along too far along okay if you, if you just said that last weekend or weekend before then yeah maybe it could happen because there's still a lot of them out but I think they're too close, too connected to the bank now for forward facing to be a huge deal. And you you have some guys that are catching them spawning, you know, on forward facing sonar and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I don't think that'll I don't think that'll be a game winner this week. Yeah, well, I know if they catch it on spinner bait, they're probably. And I'm not, a, and I, I'm I'm not for it. I'm not against it. I could really give a crap less about it. You know, that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, <clears throat> do i think it's hard on our sport yeah it is mm -hmm. it really is you well know? i think this is that time of year where like you said earlier things starting to transition to where yeah. you know like I don't, no, I don't think it'll be a factor this week right you right know? um you know and, and is it it's a tool it's a it's a tool you have to use but 
Uh, it might find you that little piece of brush that you need to pitch at out in the middle somewhere or something that you wouldn't normally throw at. But to say that you're going to have a guy stand on stage and, you know, the last day and say, oh, you know, I pitched a jig and, you know, using my forward facing sonar. I really don't think that's going to be the deal. You know, I think they're too connected to too closely to the bank and to cover to where it's going to be that big a factor. Personally. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I could, I could, man, you, me personally, you can't ever write it out, but for the reasons you said, it can be used for somebody to throw that jig. Yeah, finding the right spot. stump. <clears throat> right. Yeah, finding the right stump or a log that's under the water. Absolutely. Absolutely. It could, it could be, it could be used for that. Yeah. yeah. But as far as somebody sitting out there, you know, over 30 foot of water throwing a little minnow, uh, I, I, I find I don't think that's going to happen. I like you said. I think the fish have moved moved too tight to the bank, and it's going to be a you know more not, traditional style fishing. Yeah, I don't think the big ones are out there right now. Yeah, I think they're on the bank. It, because if they weren't in the BFL, you wouldn't have seen that many six pounders. Okay, they're on the they're on the bank. Mm -hmm. The anglers in action. Like I say, Lawson and Dirk had nineteen thirty something and finished eleventh. Guess what? There's not that many good live scopers that finished ahead of them. Okay. And if you can live scope, guess what? My son's one of the best at it. And and no, there's not enough out there for him to be chasing. So I think the bulk of them are up there have made their commitment to the bank. And we've got enough dirty water in the lake that you know that's gonna be the deal. So hey, Glenn's got the ultimate prediction. He's calling a seven and a half pounder on a pink floating lizard. Guess what? They don't see that very often. Is that Glenn Sims? That is. Is that Glenn Sims? He was trying to sell me some of them two weeks ago here on the lake. I'm hey, just kidding. I, I, I did see him a couple weeks ago. Uh, it, <laughs> it could be. It could be. You know, a floating lizard. Is on a mojo that, rig. A floating lizard is something that a lot of people don't throw anymore. And uh, and trust me, you put that on the back of a little mojo. Guess what? It'll catch mm -hmm. them. I but, actually had a conversation in the boat with my buddy Darius at Kentucky Lake about. Do you remember the the black lizard that had yellow polka dots on it? You betcha. Yes, sir. Well, we had a conversation about that because a, a buddy of mine in my bass club. It's been about fifteen years ago. We we fish a one fish bass club. And we were fishing over an olive branch in Southern Illinois. And there's a, there's a, an old oxbow lake that's close to the river called horseshoe lake. It's got a bunch of cypress trees and it's silted in real bad. And it's tough. It's got carp and gar and all the roughest, nastiest fish you can think of. And there's not very many bass in there. So he caught a six something pounder in that derby. And we got to talking about what, what the heck did you catch? You know, nobody, I don't think anybody else had a bite. You know, he might have caught two bass and one of them was a six something and he won. But we got to we finally got him to cough up what he caught him on. And he caught it on a black salamander with the yellow polka dots. And so I personally spent at least an hour on the Internet trying to find a black salamander with yellow polka dots. And I was unsuccessful. But him talking about that, that pink floating lizard just kind of bring that back into my memory. And there's some yeah. little sneaky baits out there that still work. You you won't see a Hibden's boat leave the dock this time of the year without some black yellow polka dots. Really? Oh yeah, that's okay. just that's just an old standard. I mean, you just pack them around. Yeah, we need it, to talk. it will I need catch to one. Stuff. It will catch one. You know, and and it could be something like that. You know, take a, you know, if I did use a lizard like that, Texas rig, it'd probably be with about a sixteenth. And it would still be on 17 pound line, something that really falls slow, you know. Uh, you know, that's that's a good way of catching a big old bass during the spawn. I mean, it really is. And, and when I say during the spawn, I'm talking pre spawn too, you know, because there's something about that thing floating down beside one of them old docks, you know, it can it can make a big difference. I think it is from Mr. Twister. Does that sound right or not? Oh, there was a whole bunch of people made them. Okay. Yeah, okay. there's several different people made them. I, I had them. I, I mean, 
cream, maybe cream. I think cream maybe made some of them too, possibly. Um, there's, there's they were popular. Of, trust me, you can. You don't want to go back in the archives with, with my butt. I got more crap, more rubber shit than <laughs> any hundred thousand people. You know, that's yeah. one thing my dad, my dad did thrive on. That was rubber baits, and uh, yeah, if it was made, he had some of them. Yeah, well, I want to ask you just. A couple more questions here, and we'll wrap this up. Um, this this is interesting to me. Like nowadays, all these bass tournaments, you got a live camera in the boat. You've got YouTube, and you know everybody's running a GoPro. And then there's really not a lot of secrets. There's secrets, but it's a lot harder to keep a secret. Back in the day, when you were out on the circuit, kicking everybody's butt, did you? Um, was it? Was it a lot harder to keep a secret back then? Was it easier to keep a secret? And then were there some secrets that you had between you and your dad that, you know, gave you a little bit of an advantage against your other competitors? Well, we were our worst, our own worst enemy, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, because, because we wanted the co-anglers. My, my dad was always convinced that, that fishermen don't buy a fish and tackle co-anglers buy fish and tackle. And so when we would get out there in the boat with them, we made sure they had the right stuff to fish with. And, and when I say that we shared lures. Now there's some stuff, there's some stuff back in the day that we took back from them, you know, Hey, you can't take that home with you. You can use it all day long and catch as many pounds of bass as you can catch, but you can't take that home with you. <laughs> You know, and um, and we we kept stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it was probably, you know, it was probably easier back then to kind of keep stuff to yourself a little bit, uh, because if you didn't win, then you didn't get on film much, anyways. Uh, you know, so but when you won, that was your chance to put it on the map. You know, show everybody, let everybody see. Uh, in this day and age, it's just different. Everything's immediate, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, they see what you're using. You know, when you're out there on the water, you know, it, it, it's just it's immediate. Everything's immediate. They see it before you're done fishing that day, most of the time. Um, what what I like is is the one little Jap that was leading angler of the year after the first two tournaments this season. And he kept his back to the camera completely. And every time he caught a fish, he would get the fish in the boat, unhook the bait. He'd pull a bill dance and reach clean over the top of his lure, unhook it and throw it right back in the lake and put the fish in. And I thought, holy crap, look at that. He is keeping this stuff quiet now. <laughs> and you would never see it come over his head. He would never throw it out this way. All of his casts were just a little sling it out in front of the boat. And that's so you couldn't see it. And uh, and Bowman, the one of the commentators for Bass, Bowman, it, it actually pissed him off that he wasn't sharing anything. And he act, and and like I say, the little guy acted like, oh, he didn't understand the question. He understand full blown <laughs> what the question was. He just ain't gonna show everybody. Yeah. And the crazy thing about it was, let Angler of the Year after the first two Texas tournaments, you know. And, um, and, and it was just, it was funny to me, you know, and, and did, did we do stuff like that? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I've got stuff that people have still never seen. That's why that guy in his 50 shades of green pumpkin question kind of pissed me off a little bit. Um, you know, it's none of your damn business. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, no, I'm just kidding on that. Uh, not really, but kind of, um, you know, you, you, you have a little, little twists that you do that everybody else might not do. Um, and can you milk it a little bit? Yeah, you can a few tournaments, you know, a little bit, uh, but it's going to get out. It's going to get out pretty quick anyways. Uh, and the crazy thing about it is you've only got so long to sell stuff in this day and age, you know, in this day and age, by the time you win a tournament on it, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the internet, nobody would care because there's another tournament going on before they even know you won that one. Yeah. You know, used to be we had one a month and you had about a month for your sponsor to get that out there and get it promoted and sell it. Well, now there's one every week. 
you know, between MLF and the Elite Series, there's a different tournament every week. How can you keep up? You know, how can you keep up with something new or something different, you know? But these guys in this day and age, they're not making money off of lure sales. They're not. That's not part of their project. You know, their, their program has nothing to do with selling fish and tackle. You know, they're selling locators now. That's what they're selling. Mm-hmm. You know, Garmin, Lawrence, and Hummingbird, by golly, they got to be licking their chops right this minute because that's what they're selling. You know, there is, the fish and tackle industry is actually in the crapper right now. You know this. Mm-hmm. Everybody else in the industry knows it too. And it's because people aren't buying tackle. People are not buying tackle like they used to. And it's got the whole industry kind of screwed up a little bit. You know, you go to talk and spending, you know, the average Joe, when you go to telling him that, uh, you know, Zaldane's web, web deal that he did when he went around and interviewed everybody on their boats mm-hmm. and the low dollar ones were 30 grand. Yeah. That was the cheap ones. That's the guys that only had four units, you know, four units and, and three different transducers, you know, and they're still spending 30 extra grand on top of a hundred thousand dollar bass boat. And some of that was low ball too. Some, yeah, of that some, was- of it, some of it's low ball completely. Yeah. You know, and then, then you have other guys that are spending in, in excess of 45 to 50 grand yeah, that's insane. on a boat. And that, the cool thing about it is those guys actually think that they had to have that to compete. Well, guess what? That doesn't leave much room for going in and buying you a bag of worms. I mean, that's a lot of dang money. I don't care if you are a professional. You know, you, you still, and it's amazing to me at the co-anglers and stuff like that that feel like they can't compete without it. These high school kids, you can't believe. I, I sit and I, I walk down the side of the boats during that tournament, you know, as I was going back to load my boat out that, that, mo- that evening, the forward facing sonars on absolutely everything, you know, simple as that. Guess what? These parents don't think that their high school kids can compete without it. So therefore they, they're rigging them. They're 20 grand, extra 20 yeah. grand on that bass boat. You're going to do everything you can to support your child. And absolutely. If you think that, that makes a difference. Absolutely. You're going to, you know, hey, Park, Hank Parker's little deal on, on, you know, that he put out there that, that, you know, it actually gave Randy Blockett a little bit of validation on his, on his rant. And and I like Randy, don't get me wrong, because they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. They are not wrong at all. It is, it is messing up our sport somewhat because so many of these kids, they don't, they don't think they got a chance, you know, Oh, I, I, I can't afford that. You know, my dad can't afford to put that on our boat. You know, how am I going to compete when I get out here or go out there and stuff like that? And and you got to give it to them. The way the elite series is looking right now, this time of the year, oh, you really can't compete without it. You know? Um, So, you know, what, what are we teaching these kids? Are we teaching these kids uh, fundamental fishing patterns? Uh, Are these kids learning how fish migrate? Uh, I mean, really? No, not really. I mean, they're not learning that stuff. And, and and it's hard on a guy with this much gray hair to sit and even think about it and talk about it because that's not how I was brought up. You know, I was brought up to, to get out there, work my butt off, go find them, look for them, you know, and, and it's, it's gotten kind of out of hand. I, I don't know if you watched the Bassmaster Classic. It was hard to watch. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was not a fun one to watch, you know, the way the guys caught them and stuff like that. It, it's, you know, it, it, it's, we, we worked for so long to get the TV involved so it would be interesting for the spectators and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I, I watched that. Scotty Schiffler win the Masters yesterday. That's freaking cool. Because I sit there and I watched him do it. We worked so hard to get bass fishing to that point. And now all we see is the back of those kids. All we see is their back. You know, you, you never see your their lures. Uh, 
There's really not that much excitement to it. And then you get the commentators that get online, that get on there. And the crazy thing about it is they're using like Greg Hackney and Gerald Swindell and some of those guys to try to make justify it to everybody. And I loved Hackney's theory on it. Those guys are going to last longer in a four day event because they don't make as many casts as we do. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, they're not going to wear out. Oh, that's good. You know, if they throw the buzz bait, they wear their ass slap out. You know, yeah, right. these guys are not making that many casts. They're not making long casts. They're just pitching it out in front of the boat, pitching it in front of him and catching him. You know, is it an, is it an art form? Absolutely. It is. But in the end, kind of making, making it not that interesting to watch, you know, and, and, and that's we worked a long time to get TNN and and ESPN and and you know all these people Fox to to film it and make it look good and and show the excitement and you know like I say mark my words there'll be a tennis shoe sponsor for live scoping real soon you know because that's all you <laughs> yeah. see you see yeah. their tennis you see oh well he's wearing a pair of Nikes there while he's watching his locator you know. It, it's going to happen that way, you know. I, I tell you what, I tell you what, like the, the major league fishing, uh, the BPT was on over the weekend, and uh, that that format, not to go sideways on a tangent, but that the every fish counts format can be makes for some really boring uh, TV sometimes, too, um, especially. When it starts getting way out of hand, you know, it's the final day and second place is, you know, 80 90 pounds, pounds behind. Wheeler's got 120 pounds and yeah. he's just moving. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's boring as it's to me, that's even more boring than a five fish forward facing sonar tournament. It's just and, like, and it's, and it's also kind of like, it's kind of like that deal down there at Lake Fork, the slot limit. Yeah. Everybody has to keep in mind why that crowd is standing there watching that way in. They didn't come to watch the fishermen because the fishermen, there's less and less heroes out there now. Less and less heroes walk across that stage every time. Okay. They're all new guys. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. I was a new guy once. But one of the main deals is every time they think it's the fishermen that those people are watching, they want to see the fish. They yep. want to see how they would rank. You know, when you come in and you say, well, I caught 120 pounds. Really? Really? Oh, well, that's good. Where are they at? Let me look out. The fish are still the stars. That That's what makes you a hero. That's what makes you a star. My dad told me time and time again, he said, you know, even if I only catch two, but if they're five pounders, people are going to cheer for me. If my fish weighs five, if I catch five that weighs 10 pounds, but if I catch two that weighs 10 pounds, Everybody in that crowd is going to clap and they're going to look as I hold up those two big bastards and they're going to say, wow, look at those right mm -hmm. there. Man, he caught a pair of big ones. The fish are what makes it exciting. You know, holding up a 12 pounder at Lake Fork, that's what's exciting, you know, and, and, and I just, you know, I just think some of these formats have lost sight of what people want to see, you know, no spectators, you know, and, and when I say no spectators, it's getting harder and harder. They go to the Bassmasters Classic for one reason. It's a great show. It's an awesome show. You go to that, there's no sports show that showcases bass fishing like the Bassmasters Classic. Okay? But it used to be fun to watch the TV show, too. It's just not. It's not, it's not the same now. And like I say... Everybody worked a long time to make it to where it was something for everybody to see. I, th I think they should turn. Well, one comment on that is it's hard to keep eight hours of live fishing interesting. I mean, that's a long time. You know, we used to, one of the best things to watch back in the day was that 45 minute compressed highlight, you know, thing that they produced that had, it was action packed and it was, it was just hard hitting. Now, now you got four days of fishing, four four times eight, whatever that is. My math's not the greatest, but that's a lot of fishing that you're sitting there trying to soak up. And and anybody that's fished very many times knows that 
most of your catches happen in a short window. I mean, there's a lot of dead time out there. You know, you may go two or three hours without getting a bite. And um, that's just kind of the way you come in, you come in at the way in with 20 pounds, you know, a lot of that happened in an hour's worth of fishing time. And then you got seven hours where nothing really happened. So it's hard to stretch all that out. I spent 30 days in a hospital. And that's a long time to lay on your back and sit and stare at the ceiling. So I watched a lot of YouTube. And I'm going to tell you right now, Scott Martin's not my favorite person in the whole world. I mean, I, I've had trouble with him a time or two. and and But I would rather watch his YouTube show than most any of the rest because every now and then, it's good to see the wheels come off the train. I, I mean, holy crap. There's nothing like a NASCAR race that that goes round and round and round until somebody crashes. When you crash, you can't look away. It's the same way in bass fishing. Every now and then, you got to watch somebody lose it, you know, and that's what it's all about, you know, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, and, 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 and you just, like I said, it, it's, we got to keep that in mind as we go forward, you know, at some point in time we got to make this interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, do I think it's cool that an 18 year old boy won Lake Fork? Absolutely. I was that 18 year old kid once that was me. You know, I, I, I did, I tried to win and stuff like that, you know, and, and is it cool? Do I, do I take anything away from him? No. Awesome little old fisherman. Hard to watch. It was just so, it's so hard to watch. And, and I think we got to, somebody has got to come up with a happy medium. You know, catching them, turning them back, weighing them in on the spot, like you said, in those team, those team MLF deals and stuff like that. Is it fun to watch a four-man team or a four-man team beat three other four-man teams? Not when they're ninety pounds behind. No, no, kind of uneventful, really. You know, uh, so you know it, it. It gets to that point where you, you know, this is just hard to watch. And, and like I say, we worked so many years to make it where it was fun to watch. And, you know, when, when you see Larry Nixon look over his shoulder as a 10 pounder jumps out of the water and he goes, Oh my gosh, you know, that's what people want to see. You know, they want to see that, you know, they want to see Denny Breyer flip under a boat dock on Lake Gunnersville and a six pounder jump head high, you know, that's, that's what they want to see every now and then. And I'm not saying that it's got to be seen every fish catch, every deal, you know, but just, you know, I think we got to take a step back and, and look and see what, what we're teaching everybody, you know, what, what, you know, are these kids learning what they need to learn? You know, uh, I hope so because that's the future of our sport, you know, and if all they think is, you know, they got to have, $30,000 worth of electronics on the front of their boat where they can't compete. Most of them ain't going to make it. You know? No, no, that that's going to, that's going to win you a, a little bit here and there, maybe, but it's not, I don't think in the long run, you know, you got to have fundamentals by the, by the way, uh, hashtag B A S H capital. Um, we're going to do the $25 bait works gift card giveaway. So we'll let that run for just a little bit and then we'll, Cool. Will and draw it. Um, but yeah, you know, the fundamentals are. You, you, so there's two forms of thought on this. And, and I've had I've had a lot of the best guys, you know, with the front lookers on here. And, and we had Menendez on here not too long ago. And uh, we had a great conversation about the whole Ford facing sonar deal. Um, there there is. It's kind of a the you can learn fish locations with that technology somewhat but if you don't know seasonal patterns and how to keep track of the fish and you just think that by having forward facing sonar you're going to go out and dominate it, it, it's probably not going to happen like i said you might do it a, a once or twice but you got there's no shortcuts you're going to have to learn that kind of stuff and whether you learn it by looking at that that graph and it shows you hey there's a bunch of fish in this area and you go back and you look at the map and you're like okay the reason those fish are in this area is because it's springtime and there's a channel swing right there and they're making their way back and maybe you learn that by looking at them on your forward-facing sonar and you put two and two together 
But I think somebody that's not willing to do the hard work that it takes and go out there and put the pieces together, they're, they're going to fade away. I mean, they might do okay. And, and as far as having like multiple forward facing sonar transducers, um, some of the best guys out there have one, you know, you look at Cody Huff, you look at uh, Drew Gill, Jake Lawrence, um, you go down the list. Most of those guys have one. Um, it's getting out of hand when you start getting two. And, and, and I personally, you know, Menendez is on, is on the committee that's looking into, um, you know, limitations on, on electronics or, or just, they're just keeping a track of all this stuff. And, you know, I, I personally feel like, uh, I'm for freedom a hundred percent. I don't, I don't even like saying that we need limitations on anything because sometimes you give an inch and, and they take a mile type of thing. But I do think that there needs to be some kind of perimeters set because like you said, that Koi Fujita, the Japanese angler you spoke of, he's got mm -hmm. five, I think five or six live scope transducers on his boat. I mean, I don't know that that's that's a lot in my opinion i think there has to be some sort of compromise to where we put some perimeters on things and everybody can play within a level playing field um i don't think it's going away uh, personally but i think it needs to be there need to be some perimeters in my opinion um that's just that's just my feelings on the whole thing i don't i i really i you know to say i have a huge opinion on it my, you know, my only opinion is, is, you know, we, we can't lose sight of where we came from, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I really think that, that, that we are, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, and, and when you say what you say, what you just said there, uh, let's face it, John Q public, uh, you know, gets told whether they're going to buy, wh where they're going to vote Democrat or Republican, by which news network you watch. True. Okay. And that's always going to be that way. It's all in the perception, you know, and, and like I say, right now, their perception is getting out of hand. And, uh, you know, I know I fished with a 12 year old boy, you know, last week in the, in that tournament. And, and his main thing was wondering how he was going to afford to move on it, oh my gosh, he's 12 years old. You know, he, he should be worried about years old. on a Zara spook, mm -hmm. you know, or, or catching one on a jig every now and then. And, and he's really, he's thinking about, you know, well, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have to figure out how to save up my gas, you know, my lawn mowing money and come up with an extra 10 grand so I can help dad rig out our new rig out our boat, you know, with, you know, better forward facing and stuff like that. And, and and I told him, dude, I said, this, I said, things are going to change. I said, they've got to a little bit, you know, and, and like I say, we get told what to think, you know, and, and we get told on a daily basis through the media and everything else. And, and, uh, you know, I think everybody just needs to think, you know, a little bit about what we've worked for, for so many years and, and where it's going and, and, uh, there's so many of these anglers out here. There's never going to be a really, really good, efficient advisory board because everybody's afraid that they're going to ruffle the feathers of the next person, you know, and you can't ruffle the feathers of the next person or you won't get sponsored by people and stuff like that. So, so you're never going to get everybody's honest opinion uh, because they have sponsors to keep happy, you know, simple as that, you know, uh, you know, is is Watson doing a bad thing? Watson, Watson's just pointing out what everybody else wants to say. He's just not smart enough to keep it quiet to himself, you know. And and, and I, I love James to death. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, he's got a sack that drags the ground as far as I'm concerned. And let me tell you something. Good for him. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. Good for him. Some somebody like me, yeah, I've been in it a long time, but I can't say nothing, you know, because I don't have any pull with anybody. I don't have any sponsors that that care or anything about what I gotta say, you know. But but it's just one of those deals. Everybody needs to just sit back, take a good long look at the sport and and say, 
is this what we all want? You know, is this what everybody wants? Uh, is this what John Q. Public wants? You know, because the crazy thing about it is these people that are calling in on your web, your your podcast here and everything, guess what? They want our opinion. They yeah. really do. Because if they didn't, they wouldn't sit here and listen to all of our crap that we've sat here and talked to for the last two hours. They want our opinion. Right. And, and, it, and if you can't give it to them, then what, what are we here for, you know? And, you know, it boils down to a lot of political stuff, you know. Freedom of speech is freedom of speech, you know. Um, unless you're Watson, and then, no, you can't say anything. You know, you're out. <laughs> and, and you know, so... Depends on the contract you've signed, you know. That's right. You know, it depends <laughs> on what you sign, what you can say. And, and I know, I grew up through it. I lived through it for many, many years. My dad could have been a rich man if he would have just kept his mouth shut on some things, but he couldn't, you know, and, and, and I, and I can't, you know, uh, you know, and it's nothing more than I'm going to say what I think's right. And, and like I say, is it right, wrong? No, it's not. It, it's, you know, it's my opinion. Does Randy Block have an opinion? Yep. And I can't say I disagree with it a hundred percent. Do I agree, disagree with some of it? Sure. He goes a little overboard on some of it, but some of it, he's telling the facts. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. If, if you, if you watch, if you listen to what Block is saying, I mean, you really look, listen to what he's saying, like the heart of it. Now, like you said, he, he does expand one way or the other for whatever reasons. He's, he's a business guy. So I understand he gets a lot of views and a lot of clicks and power to him, man. He's done a hell of a job doing it. Um, me being, on YouTube, I, I respect that part of it. It's it's not it's not me. That's not who I am. What he's doing, but you got to give him respect for what he's doing. So, but the 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 core of what he's saying does make sense. I mean, there's sure. some legitimate whether you're for forward facing someone or against it. If you just take the dismay for that certain person and you just listen to if if you were just to take what he's saying and write it down on a piece of paper and and not put the author's name by it and just, just read what he's saying. A lot of it, like you said, does make sense because this is a tradition. Um, this is something that has been near and dear to all of us, all of us that are watching this stream. You know, we've got stories with our, with our parents, with our relatives, with friends, and it's all, you know, it's fishing stuff. It's a, it's not just about the money and about the fame. It's, it's, Fishing's deeper than that. It's a heritage. There's a heritage side of it. Um, and, and Ford Face and Sonar is something that's come along. And it's definitely, there's a reason that it's become so polarizing. Um, and and it, there is, there's an element of threat behind it if we take it too far and we don't, um, if we don't use some common sense and, and be stewards of the body of water that we fish. And I think crappie fishing is something that can really, really be hurt by a, uh, forward facing sonar with with bass they're going to get smarter but we typically practice catch and release so we're going to catch these fish they're going to get smarter and smarter they're going to be harder to catch but we're typically throwing them back crappie you know they're they're getting kept and you can you can put a hurting on a smaller body of water um, when you're looking at them and, and keeping all the fish but but it's a it you know there's no there's no easy answer to this whole thing that we're in. Um, no. you, got, you got sponsors, like you said, you got Garmin, Lawrence, Hummingbird. They're making money. They're licking their chops. This is like, this is a big thing for them the last several years. And you got these pros that are promoting it and it's just everywhere. And people are talking about it. Um, but you got some traditionalists that are, that are fighting it. Um, and I think that there's a place for both of it, but we've got to, we got to come to some compromises somewhere and we just got to remember that fishing is supposed to be about fun and it's supposed to be about uh, spending time together on the water and it's become so polarizing. And that's, to me, that's the biggest disappointment in the whole forward facing sonar debacle is it's just, you got people just like you said, Republicans and Democrats, you got people that are just duking it out and fighting. And a lot of times we're not listening to each other. Yeah. We're not, you got to listen to everybody and you may not agree you can agree to disagree but at least give the people time of day to to listen and see if there are some points um you know 
the person that's sitting across the table from you, we're we're ninety percent the same most of the time. We may disagree on some smaller things, but if we can listen to the things that we disagree on and at least say, "Hey, I disagree with that," but I I understand where you're coming from. Um, I think that's the key to uh, us moving forward and coming to some kind of compromise on this whole thing. There's got to be a there's got to be a a good compromise somehow, some way, somehow. I mean, there's got to be something that we can come up with that works for everybody, uh, you know, a little bit. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, I don't see what it is just yet. Uh, you know, and like I say, I'm pretty old school, you know, pretty. Um, I, my my ex-wife called me a dinosaur. And, and she was right, you know, and, and for the most part, I need to just get out of the way. Let the extinction happen, and I just need to slide out of the way and let them go by and let them do whatever they want to do. You know, I'll win one in September here on Lake of the Ozarks every now and then, and and uh, because I can skip better than everybody else, and and uh, you know, but but it, it's it's just one of those deals. It's you know, it's it's hard to watch. It's hard to look at. You know, sometimes, and uh, you know, like I say, I spent a lot of time watching. You know, I did. I spent a bit, spent about a month watching everything YouTube had to offer, and and uh, and like I say, I know what I like to watch, and I know what I didn't like to watch. You know, and uh, and like I say, I consider myself fairly educated bass fisherman. You know, and like I say, some of it's extremely hard to watch. You know, and uh, you know. So, but anyways. Any more questions about the bash? Let's get let's give away something. All right, let's do that. All right, we're gonna draw. All right. Chris Curtis, congratulations, Chris. Um, get a hold of me on Gabe Montgomery, Gabe Montgomery Fishing, or Ten Horse Monty on Facebook. Or Ten Horse Monty Six on Instagram, and I will get you taken care of tomorrow. Let's get this out of here. Get back to the main screen. There we go. I did that pretty smooth. It's kind of new to me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I guess that's it, man. We we covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of yeah. ground. I, it's always fun hanging out with you. Um, and thanks to everybody that that listen to us ramble on for almost two and a half hours. Um, good luck out in the water. I hope, if, I hope, man, I hope I'd love to see an eight pounder Dion. I'd, I'd just be taking pink. I tell I'd you what, this things are sizing up as good as it ever has had. I mean, you know, really, I, you know, that weather that's coming in towards the end of the week, that ain't gonna make no difference. That's not gonna make any difference. I don't think, I mean, I think they're gonna, they're gonna continue to eat just like they have the last couple of weekends and, and, uh, you know, a couple of cool nights is not going to shut them down. So yeah, it should be a great tournament. I, I agree. I don't think, like you said, once they're once they're in the area and they got that on their mind, they're not going to swim all the way back out to the main lake and the, no, the main river. Yeah, and yeah. like I say, there's a ton of dingy water out there. So, you know, when that with that much dingy water, they're not going out deep in that. They're going to stay up shallow in that. So. So and it's it stays warmer too. Are you gonna be are you gonna be around uh at the festivities this weekend? Or yeah, you... I'm gonna have to be there for something, I know. Uh leastwise Big Al was wondering and I'm actually doing a we're doing a podcast tomorrow night. Um uh, and we're doing that with with Terrell. So with the Terrell family. So we're gonna Oh you are okay. Yeah. What's what's that gonna be on? Um uh, uh it's on apple uh it's a uh, unfiltered real talk unfiltered real talk and that is that what is that at bryant's yeah it's Say bryant's outdoors okay. yeah okay yeah so everybody on here go check that out uh yeah. you know what time six o'clock tomorrow six o'clock six o'clock on wednesdays we've done about four five shows now and and uh They've all been received real well. Everything seems to be going great. Uh, 
we try to get a different angler on there every week uh, of some sort. Um, like this year or tomorrow, we're doing uh, Randy Trail, you know, the owner of Anglers in Action. Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to get him on there and talk about the bash some and, and just, you know, we go on there and we talk about it a little bit of everything, whatever everybody wants to hear about. You had, um, didn't you have Jim Dill on recently? We did. We had Jim Dill on. Uh, we're going to have Denise on. We're going to have uh, some of the women on. We're going to have some of the wives come on, do that little little deal, see what they think about it um, or, you know, what they think about their husbands fishing and stuff. Um, we're just trying to get a different outlook for everybody. Let everybody, you know, not just go on and talk about forward-facing sonar and fishing. You know, we're going to try to talk about everything, yeah. you know, uh, what people want to know about. Um, we got a deal we call a shameless plug. We're only allowed to talk about our sponsors of any kind for about 30 seconds towards the end of the show. Uh, so <laughs> we, we pick a couple and we hit them hard and then we're done. Uh, but we try to keep it pretty open-minded and, and uh, talk about this, that, and everything, you know? So, so yeah, tune in tomorrow at six. Um, should be good. I mean, like I say, Randy's a, Randy's a corker, you know? He told us last week, he says, don't forget, I'm 80 years old. I might forget before it gets to be next Wednesday. I was like, yeah, you're fixing to handle 4,000 damn bass fishermen. Surely you can remember Wednesday night at 6. Yeah. So, but uh, but anyways, he's a good guy, too. Fun, fun to be around. So it ought to be a good show tomorrow. Well, you'll have to make sure you you send him that uh, that reminder text about noon tomorrow. That's right. That's right. That's what I told That's what he told. He told Jamie, my partner in crime in the deal i he told me he says hey you might call me on wednesday <laughs> you know I'm like okay we'll get you so yes, sir. but all right yeah. man we're, we'll wrap this sucker up um uh, thanks again for hanging out with us and you uh bet you anytime boys we'll do it again soon if i offended anybody about forward facing sonar i don't care really <laughs> i'm sorry i just i apologize but i just it, it's heartbreaking for me some of the stuff so I think everybody yeah. understands. So I, I like to say I I apologize, but but anyways, all right. Have a good evening. All right. Good night, everybody.